more. So welcome everybody uh, to this meeting of the Pacific Northwest section of the Audio Engineering Society. I'm Dan Mortensen, the current chair of the section. I have several announcements and bits of business before we start. First, our next meeting will be Thursday, May 18th at DigiPen in Redmond, Washington. It will be simultaneously online as well. And I've got a little description from Lawrence. L Lawrence, are you here? Okay. Um, I know what these individual words mean, but I'm not clear exactly what they are talking about in the sequence that they exist. So undoubtedly, a lot of you will know more than I do about it. Um, this will be a feature presentation by Epic Studio software engineer and DigiPen graduate Max Hayes. And I'm going to interject that I think he means Epic is a company rather than that Max is an Epic audio software engineer, although I'm sure he is. They could both be uh, true, yeah. Yes. Um, who will discuss his work on the Unreal game engine. Increasingly, Unreal is being used not only by game developers, but also by film studios. Max will demonstrate tools he designed that allow for sample accurate synchronization of music and sound with picture in the Unreal Engine. So that's it. Um, that's May 18th and the notice and ticketing will go live next week. Um, I have a little AES blurb about the Audio Engineering Society. We operate under the auspices of the International Audio Engineering Society and that gives us the gravitas to be able to invite people like Sean and you to our meetings. The AES depends on funding from member dues for its existence. And if you are inclined to want to join this group or uh, learn more about audio, and there's all kinds of audio resources that you get by being a member that you can't get by being a non-member. Um, if you want to join, we encourage you to do that. If you uh, get to the point of filling out the membership application and you have uh, need references for that part of it, you can use any of us for that because we're happy to be it. We don't think they even check them, but there they are. Um, we also want to thank those who donate to our section by choosing to purchase the 5 or $10 tickets when registering at Eventbrite. We use that money to fund our section activities, and it's turned out to be a real nice source of uh, income for us. It's not gigantic. I think we're getting $45 from this meeting, uh, but it's it helps. Every bit helps. Regardless of that money stuff, it's real important to us that our meetings stay free and open to all people, and we welcome everyone. But we do very much appreciate those who choose to financially support us as well by their presence, uh, as well as by their presence. Um, both of those are important. And speaking of welcoming everyone, the AES has a diversity and inclusion committee, and I attended the first one of their meetings that I ever attended. Uh, and it was a real interesting thing. I, I realized how uh, Im welcoming it is to have us all put our personal pronouns in our names to show people who happen to show up that are not binary that they're welcome here. So I'm in encouraging you to do that. And as soon as I stop jabbering here, um, I'll turn off the the system so that you can rename yourself. And we also want your full name uh, to be here. We like to know who we're talking to. So um, you do that changing by either if you're in the uh, uh, gallery view, you can click on the name that's next to your picture and rename yourself there. Or you can go to the participants list and find yourself in the participants list. And if you kind of hover on or near the little icon for the camera, it'll come up, uh, the option to rename yourself will come up. And we would like to have your full name and or personal pronoun showing. Um, and if you can't figure it out, it's no big deal if you personal private message me or one of the other co-hosts, but not Sean or Micah. Uh, and we can rename you even after we lock that feature. We, we turn that the, the locking name thing off uh, on so that you cannot rename yourself at some point because it, some time ago somebody came to one of our meetings and renamed themselves the same as somebody who was actually in the meeting and then started saying disparaging things about 
the situation and the people in the meeting, uh, which was not horrible, but it was kind of a pain. And that person got wound up being thrown out along with the unsuspecting person who whose name was used, uh, which was kind of weird for that person. And rather than have that again, we lock the rename thing after a while. So I think it's still locked now unless somebody's locked it. But I'll, as soon as I shut up, I'll uh, go to that. Um, speaking of the pronouns, our section bylaws, along with most other AES section bylaws, are riddled with the gender assumptions, he, him, chairman, vice chairman, etc., which are not all well are all not welcoming, and the AES National has been moving to resolve that issue. We want to be in the forefront of that, and we're almost ready to re submit our revised bylaws, which includes revisions on other subjects in the bylaws that have been murky or unclear to our voting members, um, and and we're going to uh, vote to approve that or disapprove it, I guess, in June at our June meeting, which is when I, we have elections for the committee people who run this section. If you'd like to be part of our group, uh, our, our committee, and help us plan and present our meetings, let me or any one of us know that and we'll get you on the ballot. You can be either an associate or a full member, but not a student member. Student members can come to our meetings, but they can't hold office on our committee. Students have their own committees, apparently. Um, if you don't live in the Pacific Northwest, you do have to declare to the AES that we are your primary section. If you're not a member now, but, but would be willing to join if you win the election, that's fine. The terms are two years and membership is one, so you gotta be prepared for that. Uh, on the committee, we get to talk amongst ourselves about a lot of interesting subjects, audio and other things too. And I've enjoyed being part of the committee for the last 32 years. And I gotta say, when I figured that out today and put that down, that's a long time, but it's, years are kind of like magazines. As you get older, you get a pile of them eventually. So anyway, maybe you'd enjoy being on it too and let us know and we'd be happy to have you part of us, part, be part of us. So the, the question and answer policy and the camera mic policy for tonight will be that video cameras will remain off throughout the presentation for everyone but Sean and Micah. If you don't turn yours off before I'm done speaking, we will do that for you, and that makes it more difficult for you to turn them on later again, to, again later. So please turn them off now or soon and keep them off until after the presentation, which will be a maximum of two hours. If anybody abuses that, we will be able to shut it off and, and stop it. Um, Sean will feels more comfortable if you t ask questions as they come up with you so that we have a conversation. And we, we did that last meeting, the last couple, I think, and it's worked out pretty well. Um, so when you have a question, open your mic and ask the question, but keep it off when you are not actually asking a question. Uh, if you're in speaker view and the video is, the video recording is, it's annoying if you make a noise with your mic on and it sh the camera shifts to you or your blank name on a thing. Um, so please keep your mics off. And your questions need to be finite questions, meaning not indefinite length and not statements of your own. Um, I'll stop you if you ramble and you don't ask a question soon after you've started. Uh, we, this is Sean's presentation and we wanna hear him. Um, while we're here to hear Sean, after the presentation, we hope you'll stick around so we can meet you and hear what you do in audio. We make a point of hearing from everyone who's here since one of the beauties of this Zoom thing is that we have literally no time limit. We'll stay around as long as people are interested and involved. Okay, did I leave anything out in that? That was a lot. All right, um, I'm gonna introduce Micah, Micah Hayes now, who will introduce Sean. And Micah is the one who has put this meeting together for us. So Micah, please take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm really excited about Sean being here and talking with us about a lot of his experience as a recording engineer and a producer. Um, I'll just read the introduction. Sean uh, is an engineer and producer from Brag Creek, Canada. 
who has won multiple Grammy and Juno awards for his work with Alabama Shakes, Casey Musgraves, The War on Drugs, and others. Um, he was accepted as a work study participant in the audio program at the Banff Center for the Arts in Alberta. And that's actually how Sean and I met. We worked together there. Um, and a uh, really wonderful program that, especially if you're a student, you should really look into. Uh, he relocated to LA in 2005 and began engineering for producer Tony Berg, who was a former a &R exec for Geffen Records and Virgin Music. Um, Sean has worked and you know blessed us with his creativity into record with no, multiple renowned artists, including Weezer, John Legend, Adele, Perfume Genius, Haim, Grizzly Bear, The Killers, Pharrell, and Beck. Lots and lots of cool stuff. <laughs> Lots of cool stuff. So, um, Sean, uh, actually, do you do you remember when we first met? Do you remember how we first met? Well, I, I I definitely remember how we first met, but I don't remember the exact moment when we first met. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just remember that you were um, when I went to Banff that you were the uh, the the cool guy there that knew um, knew the the music that I was into, and and you know, you're you're my buddy. <laughs> yes yes and you were the cool guy who like uh, was doing all this cool stuff and you had the van so you could like drive I didn't have a car up there so yeah you that's right had the yeah. van yeah I, I do remember missing out because we both were really into Radiohead and like <laughs> Kid A I think had just come out right right and they were playing in Vancouver and you were going <laughs> to drive and I think I had even got a ticket but I wasn't able to go because like I had to record um I think Patrick Galois, you remember him? Oh, that's right. I do remember you were going to come. I forgot about that. I'm still yeah. to this day. I'm like bummed because that album was never yeah. even released. I edited like hundreds of edits and stuff. And it was. Like, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Radiohead was way better. So, <laughs> Did you go to the show? Do you remember it? Oh, yeah. I, I went for sure. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, man. I had yeah, seen that. I saw them on their OK Computer tour in L.A. Oh, and yeah. That's a good one to be at. Yeah, and and rainbows too. But I didn't. See, I was so bummed about not seeing the Kid A tour. That would have been cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I saw in rainbows, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I remember actually before I even met you, um, we had a meeting at the Banff Center. So I had got I had been working the previous year at the New World Symphony as a recording engineer, mm -hmm. and um, had just graduated from college like a year earlier. So I was like twenty two or twenty three, and was hired to come out to Banff for like a four month. Um, fellowship or something, right? To record, be an audio associate. And I think in the first meeting where Teresa, where I met Teresa, John Sorensen, some of these other people, um, had mentioned that somebody had dropped out. And she was like, and so, and then she was like, eh, and I hired this like local boy who, yeah. uh, you know, uh, is like 18 years old and didn't even like go to college. Like she was just like really kind of like playing it down. I'm like, what? Uh -huh. and and then uh you know i don't know and then you know and then you came like the next week i was like oh this guy's pretty cool <laughs> yeah yeah and that then was, uh, my that my first memory though is like do you remember being down in that there was like a room down by the stairwell and you had like done this thing where you had recorded samples mm -hmm. into like a sampler that you would play and then do crank calls <laughs> do you remember that oh yeah i do remember that yeah I was explain, explain i don't remember it exactly what was it exactly I just had this idea in my head that it would be cool to, um, well, I think it it was like not, I mean, the Jerky Boys used to put out those albums of, of prank phone fault, uh, calls mm -hmm. and um, uh, they were kind of funny, but I thought it would be kind of like interesting if they were kind of more surreal and kind of um, moody. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would do these, these calls um, trying to just generate uh you know weird sound bites and 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 litter them across um kind of like a concept album and i can't remember even what the story was something about the north pole or something i don't remember what it was but <laughs> north um, pole. i yeah. definitely i distinctly remember because it wasn't the typical like jerky boy stuff like it's kind of rude or like i distinctly remember it was like much nicer <laughs> uh yeah it, it was, was a little I, more canadian in that way maybe but it was like nicer but like you were I, you had made these samples where you would say things like you'd click a button and say like, I like your attitude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like in a high pitch, like elf yeah. voice with like yeah. music behind it or something. Yeah, it was nice stuff. And <laughs> um, nice but, stuff. but it was, there was only 16 sample pads. So I only had 16 choices as to what I could respond or what I could respond to their questions or, or whatever. So 
yeah, I only had 16 options. I couldn't do anything beyond that, which was kind of uh, fun. Right. <laughs> and that was fun, but like that was also, and so we would call like car dealerships or something and like push the buttons, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, w- I remember like I was weaving it into music and I, I yeah, I, that was, that is a good idea, actually. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta remember to start doing that again. <laughs> well, I remember you. It was even better because you, uh, you also, I had done something I had never done before, which was you took like a landmine, and you hooked it up to like an XLR cable or something, didn't you? Do yeah, that well, to the, like record phone calls or something. The cool thing about the BAMP Center was that um, they had that like tech room, and so whenever you had a kind of tech question, you could go down and ask them to like help you modify something to make it work. Um, I mean, nowadays you can just record a phone call. Obviously we're recording this phone call, but you know, back in the, in the olden times, I guess, um, the only way you could record a phone call was like, you know, to jack it into some kind of like box that you could then like take a, a quarter inch out of or whatever. Um, and so that's, uh, someone from the tech lab helped me. They, they, I think I bought it from the tech lab actually or something and they, they helped me set it up. So yeah, I was able to do it and it was very unusual at that time to be able to record the phone call. I remember being like, how do you record a phone call? Like it wasn't easy at that point. Now, now yeah. It's, now, I just remember being impressed that you had like an audio out like that you were recording from the phone call as we were calling the like the, the crank out and you were recording them and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I was I was impressed as well. I mean, it was, it was all it was all the tech lab, not, not me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah it's a yeah the other thing actually i remember as well do you remember this too like you did this like beat mashup of like beatles i remember yeah it was just i was like really into just um that sampler i think i just got i mean radiohead and stuff like that and those things that were coming out around that time were really um i I mean i guess it's not like there was like a lot of sample based music that was happening like i mean the dj shadows introducing album which was like totally sample based Mm-hmm. um and um uh you know the radio had to a certain extent we're, we're sampling some stuff you know on like um idiotech and stuff they were using sam- i was just like interested in samplers um in general and i uh, like matmos where you were like sampling um like i think like they were walking on like snow and crunching snow and stuff like that and they made that vespertine album with bjork mm. that i was really inspired by and they were just sampling weird things oh i think they those guys made an album of like total like just all plastic surgery noises like they'd gone to um uh like a like a plastic surgery office or whatever and and they recorded like the suction of the fat and everything like that and they made a whole album of this um plastic surgery noise and i just thought it was like really compelling that you could do stuff like that um when i was you know that age and i think that not 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 only was i just interested in recording i just thought the, the manipulation of audio in that way was like super interesting and um so i thought it was just sweet you know and so i i um i was really into that and so the Beatles, i i i just thought it would be cool to like make like a new beatles album um i mean obviously not as good but like just like if you could take sounds of the beatles and this has actually been done so many times since then at the time it felt like kind of fun and, and new but I mean obviously like now I mean like they did like um, Danger, Ma- uh, Danger Mouse got famous for you know taking Beatles samples and, and cutting them up with Jay-Z and made the Grey album after that and mm-hmm. that and that he basically that started his career um, but at the time it was like it didn't it felt fresh <laughs> yeah. not so fresh anymore. Um, I think Danger Mouse was a couple of years after that, right? If I'm remembering correctly, because yeah, cause... and also Paul McCartney even did it. Um, he, there was like um, there was an album I think called Fire something Fire. Fire. He had like a side project with a producer in um, England, and they also cut up old Beatles samples hmm. um, and made an album as well. So I mean, yeah, it just it, it. I think it was in the ether at the time. People just it was in the air. People people wanted to cut up Beatles samples but at the time I mean it was just a you know fun activity to be doing because you were just taking Beatles samples but then you would make just completely different music it wasn't like Beatles sounding mu- music right it was like no, you would just use like a sounding- kick and a snare and you'd make your own like beats and stuff right yeah um and it was like I was getting a little bit more molecular than that like I remember thinking like it was funny um this is obviously a lot easier to do now at the time it was just psychotic was um if uh I wanted to take like 
a, a like one second of a Beatles song. I think it was like a, a like a string in Eleanor Rigby or something like that. Eh. And then um, I would take like a waveform of a kick drum, and then I would look at the string sample and find little pieces of it that looked like the pieces of the kick drum, and I would edit each little fragment of the waveform so it looked like the sample that I was trying to reproduce. Like if I wanted to make a kick drum, I'd find little things within the waveform of the, of the, uh, of the string of the Beatles string sample and just edit each little slight. It took me hours and hours and hours and hours and hours just to make like, one kick sample. But then like you play it back and you get this like kind of demented kick like version of the kick drum that you had, you know, used as your model. Um, and, um, I thought that was like just so thrilling and then making snare drums and then figuring out different ways to just manipulate this like fragment of a, of a sample um, so that you could make a, like one song out of this, just the smallest piece of information possible. And um, I just thought that that was like really thrilling. I mean, stuff like that still is pretty thrilling to me where um, the idea that like, no matter what your source material is, like no matter what amount of information you have, even if it's the smallest amount of information, like my idea was that like you should be able to make something cool out of it, even if it's like totally nothing, you know? Um, and I, and still to this day, like, you know, I'll get stuff to mix or, or do something like that. And it's just like, you don't have enough information. You don't have like this, you don't have that. So this isn't, you know, recorded well. And you hear like a lot of excuses as to like why something doesn't sound the way people want it to sound. Mm -hmm. And and I I think that that's like, I think it's fun to like ha be up against a wall like that where you don't really, you know, you you have nothing and you have to make something out of it. Um, and I think some of my favorite things that I've worked on are like the things that like you just, you you your back is so far up against the wall and then you have to make something out of it. And then that forces you into like a kind of zone of creativity that you wouldn't have, you know, been able to access if you didn't have that, that, that problem. Yeah. You know? So, totally. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, if people don't know about, so that's cool, but like you mentioned like the Grey album, which I used to love the Grey album, but that mm -hmm. was the time when like people listened, that was how people listened to music was MP3s, right? If you don't know, like um, Danger Mouse uh, was famous for taking a, a song, like an entire song from the White Al Beatles White Album, chopping it up and then mixing it with J a song from Jay-Z's Black Album mm -hmm. and uh, at 2002 or three or something like that, maybe. Oh, um, and so, um, and then smashing them together. And like, it, it was amazing. Like the 99 problem song was really cool. And like, they were totally different from the other songs, but he was like breaking every copyright rule. <laughs> it was so illegal. But at that time, like most people were getting their music through MP3s online anyway, probably illegally as well from like Kazan's. So it, people listen to it a lot, but I feel like now people don't listen to it anymore because it's not on Spotify. You know, it's not on like uh, those kinds of streaming networks. The, the gray album anyway right yeah i'm sure it's available on youtube or something like that but it, yeah at the time it was like it was like a big deal yeah um, and i think because it was so illegal like they just it, that like that made it even more appealing to people yeah. like us to listen to <laughs> yeah and it was just yeah a different a different thing that no one had ever really quite seen before yeah definitely yeah, yeah that was very cool uh so actually I forgot to do it, but, but let's, uh, you want to do a little tour of your studio here? I kind of got started already, but I would love to. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, um, I mean, basically this is like um, the room that I um, record and mix in. Um, it's not, there's not like, maybe what I'll just do is um, here. I'm just going to spin the camera around real quick so that I can see what I'm uh, actually looking at here. Um, here, let's just go like this one second here. Where is my camera? Sorry. Okay. Ugh. Cool. Oh, yeah. perfect. This um, this is a small Neve console. Hmm. Um, that honestly I don't use much of when I'm um, when I'm uh, mixing. I mean, I do sometimes just out of fun, but. A lot of times it gets so busy in here that to be able to be pulling stuff up on consoles um, can um, take longer than than what the, the amount of time that I'm allocated. Um, there's another console here. There's a, an API, oh, uh, nice. small API. Um, 
usually there's a tape machine over in the back there, but it's being fixed right now. There's also usually a tape machine right here, but it's being fixed too. So all my tape machines are currently being fixed because they're always broken. And um, you, you told me at some point you usually record both to Pro Tools and both to two inch tape at the same time, right? Yeah. Um, so when I'm, um, when I, usually when I'm uh, tracking a, a band, well, what I do is I will have um, a tape machine running um, live. And basically what I've done is I've, I've malted the signal from each microphone. Um, one version of that sort, uh, one micro, like each microphone, one is going to uh, uh, like digital, like it's being recorded into Pro Tools. And one is going into the tape machine and I'm recording it to tape, but at the same time, that tape machine is running off of the repro head. Um, so it's um, basically, it's like, it's, it's instead of being, instead of like listening to the tape machine off of the record head, it's like, it's, 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 you're hearing the reproduction head. So it's like, you're hearing a better version of the recorded, uh, of the, of the microphone coming off of the tape. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> Um, basically because tape machines have different heads on them. I thought at first you were talking about tape delay, but it's not tape delay you're talking about. There, no, there is, um, yeah. So what happens is that like when you're recording to tape, mm -hmm. just generally, if you're recording a band to tape, um, when you record to tape, you're listening live off of, um, one specific head, um, mm -hmm. And when you pre when you stop the tape machine and then you rewind and press play again, um, it switches basically to the repro head, which is a better head, mm -hmm. but it's further away from like the record head, which it's kind of tricky to um, uh, to, uh, to explain. But basically, what it means is like if you're monitoring a tape tape like the reproduction head live while the band is recording you are hearing a tape delay because it's it's the better head to it's like a better reproduction of what's coming off of the tape i mean yeah. it's not totally necessary um is that what you monitor in the control room or do you yeah, have a so different monitor that's what i'm monitoring in the control room but you can't send that back to the band because you're they're hearing a delay it's basically like creates a big latency uh um, but it's a better version of, of what's coming off of the tape head or the, the tape, I'm sorry. Um, and what's happening is, is I am taking that head, the, the information from that source, and I'm recording that into Pro Tools at the same time. So what it does is for every microphone I'm recording of the band, I'm getting a digital version that's never touched tape, and I'm getting a version that's coming off of the tape machine. In the repro head. Yeah, and it's recording in Pro Tools as well. Oh, and the reason I do that is because um, that way, if you're recording directly to tape, at the end of like a bunch of takes or something like that, well, tape is very expensive. So if you're saving every take that a band does, you're going to spend a, like a small fortune in tape fees. Um, and so if you don't want to save every take, then you're going to need to keep recording over their their performances. But mm -hmm. if you're and and the other thing is is if you want to, if they finish a bunch of takes, then you have to then once they're done those takes and you don't have any more tape, you have to transfer all that stuff. So then you have to wait for this transfer. So if you're transferring it in real time back into Pro Tools, then you're getting the sound of tape, right. but you don't have to worry about retransferring it. The other bonus is that when you transfer something from tape um, after the fact, you can basically never get it perfectly in sync again, because, you know, tape's a bit of a wild medium and you're, and you're not going to get it in sync with the digital versions that you recorded into Pro Tools. Hmm. Like you could press play and it's never going to line back up. But if you're, if you're doing it in real time, they are in sync because it's running in real time with the actual recording. So I'm sorry if this is like too, nerd zone but um no it's perfect i love it this is uh this is an entire audience of nerd zone people yeah but but basically Sorry, what happens go for it. is after when you're finished 
you have two versions of the band. You have um, a digital version that sounds very clean. And if I keep my tape machines pretty nasty sounding so that like I have two choices, I have a dirtier tape version mm -hmm. and I can choose. So I could use the kick drum from the digital version and I could use the, the snare drum that's dirtier from the tape version, you know, and then you have a choice of each in, in individual microphone as to what you want to use. Um, so it becomes like kind of a really cool situation. So, okay, so I have one question. So do you use the same preamps for both splits? Yeah, so you use it, one preamp and then that gets malted that gets, okay. after the fact and one one goes out to digital, one goes into the tape machine. Got it. Mm -hmm. And then the tape, is it all multi-tracked into Pro Tools simultaneously or is there like a mix that you're doing as well, maybe live? So what I'm doing, what the way I'm monitoring it in the control room is I'm actually listening off of the repro head. So I'm actually hearing it delayed from the band. Yeah. And sometimes it gets even more complicated because um, like, for instance, sometimes I'm tracking so many microphones, I don't have enough channels for them to fit onto the tape machine. And at that point I'm recording like a guitar DI or some sort of um, certain things like keyboards mm. just digitally. Um, but what, what that means is if I'm monitoring off of the repro head, that means I have to adjust with delays on every single digital Tr track to adjust for the delay of the um, of the uh, repro head, it, and then it's going through another like my it, usually when I'm tracking it's going through a master bus at the same time like as if I'm mastering it, and that has so many plugins on it that like that creates another wall of latency. So sometimes there's a band playing and they'll be in the other room, and I'll be in the control room, and if you look through the window like they're like two seconds behind what I'm hearing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, that's a, yeah, that's a and, lot. Yeah. And then on top of that, it gets even more confusing because then they can't be hearing what I'm hearing. So I need to do different mixes digitally on the same Pro Tools session that are like running in a different time zone than what I'm dealing with. So, yeah, it's just ways of um, screwing with myself to just make sure I'm always on my. my and then is the uh, is the monitor mix uh and uh, do you do that on the API in the house analog or do you know there, I, I don't, I, I, at this point, I have refused to do mixes for a band because it's, that's just like the most nasty possible um, thing you could be worrying about when you're trying to track is like mm. some guy being like, I want the kick drum a little louder. Mm. So, I mean, the number one thing that I probably want in a studio beyond any piece of gear is like a headphone system where the band can make their own hit mix. I feel like if I go to any studio, I don't even ask what microphones they have. I don't, I don't like, honestly, the number one issue is like, what is your headphone setup? And if they don't have what I need, I'll bring the entire headphone setup because like my worst fear is to like have to deal with that on top of what I'm already dealing with. Like as if, I, if everybody in the band has like their own monitor, that's such a better situation to me than, than, the, than you sitting in buses or whatever and having to control the oh, water mix. Yeah, the yeah. Worst. So like an, you're talking about like the avioms or something where they can do their yeah. own little mixes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We have those at SPU. Um, the um, Dante system. Do you use Dante or I don't know? Do you? No, I have that. I have the old Furman one, which is like an analog one, but you can't even buy them anymore. But every time I see them on eBay, I keep buying them up because i mean i've just been using them forever and i just uh yeah well the older ones are actually better quality too the newer ones like the like the knobs pop off like with and months. they sound horrible <laughs> sometimes i hear those digital ones and i like put the headphones on it just sounds like pure digital death yeah uh, but these old Furman ones they sound great it sounds really good yeah uh, yeah and so yeah uh, i can show you i can sure. show more gear if you want <laughs> sure um, down here might be hard to see um, is an unfair child. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with those. Um, it's basically um, uh, it's basically like a replica of a fair child, which are now so expensive that no human being can own them. Um, I think they're like sixty to eighty thousand dollars or something like that. Um, and so, you know, when you go to these old rooms, you know, in Hollywood and you're, you book a session because a lot of these rooms are, you know, were built, you know, 
you know, for, you know, they've been around forever. They, they're like the only places that really still have these Fairchilds. And, and, and when you use them in those rooms, like you just can't believe how great they sound. You know, obviously we all have access to the, the plugin and um, they do sound, the plugin sounds good, but like it, it really is not like the same thing as like a, an actual Fairchild. I mean, they are legitimate. Like there's a reason why they're so sought after. They sound incredible, but there's a producer that he just moved out of LA, but he was here for a long time named Eric Valentine and um, he um, and a bunch of people that he works with um, at his, at his company, barefoot audio. I don't know. Are they called barefoot? There's like two barefoots. I get confused exactly with how to, in any case, they make the unfair child. And, um, um, and he, his, I had access. I, I think I was loaned or rented one for like a week and I had used it um, on on an album by, by um, Casey Musgraves, um, and I I started mixing her album, just using it, kind of just printing almost every instrument through it, like getting different settings and playing with it. And I kind of had finished working on that album, and I was like, this just became like my go-to. It was just such an incredible. Remind like, everyone yeah. exactly what it does uh, as far as like processing. It's literally just a compressor. Um, so it's just um, it's just an incredible compressor. Um, uh, um, yeah, it 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 doesn't do anything specifically different than other compressor. I mean, this one does. They've modified it so you can you know you can do side chains with it and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. I mean, you could never do that with a, 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 you know a, an old Fairchild. Um, but it, it's just literally a, a compressor, but it's just, like it's, it's, it's tubes and it's creamy sounding. It just sounds really, really incredible. So um, um, highly recommend it. Also, um, side note, um, Eric Valentine um, was actually the person that I first knew in Los Angeles. And, and when I came down here through knowing him was kind of how I got my, my foot in the door um, and um, ended up, I mean, Basically, every human being I've ever met in my life in Los Angeles um, was seeded out of the meeting of, of, of Eric Valentine. So, yeah, I definitely needed to support his company after uh, what happened to my life after I met him. Um, is he a uh, producer? What He does produce. He's a producer, right? Or Yeah, so he's a producer. So um, he did a lot of stuff. Weirdly, he did like Smash Mouth and stuff like that and like Third Eye Blind. But what um, I knew him for was um, when right around that time, I probably met you, that there was a Queens of the Stone Age album, um, uh, Rated R. Um, and um, no, it wasn't Rated R. It was Songs for the Deaf. Um, and um, like, I don't know if you heard it now, um, sonically, what it felt like to hear that album 20 years ago when it came out. But like, when that album came out 20 years ago, like there was just no, I mean, it's been copied, I think a lot since then. So um, the, 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 sa the sound of it, it maybe isn't as shocking as like what it felt like when it came out at that point. Um, but it was just like, there was like, there was those drum sounds were just so different. And like the sound of it was so different. It was, so, it was like, it was so bone dry hmm. and, and in your face. And like, it was Dave Grohl playing drums. And it was just like right up into your ear in a way that, rock albums didn't really sound like that and so um i was quite like thrilled to meet him because of the way that that album sounded it was just very very different than any other rock album that, that had come out up until that point um yeah i mean now they've a lot of people have copied it so it sounds i i, I really wonder what it sounds like to a set of you know young modern ears but at the time it was like wow um yeah yeah, I remember, uh, I mean, I, I I heard it later on, not when it came out, but it is a really amazing, for that style of music, especially, it's so tight and big. And yeah, yeah it's, it's such a great sound. And, and and especially hearing like Dave Grohl like that, I mean, I always liked the sound of um, his drums anyway, but I mean, um, all the Nirvana stuff had a, had a certain amount of room in it, um, you know, uh, like I love the sound of, of like um, In Utero, and, like, the Steve Albini stuff and um but that's um 
it's also like just as cool, but it's a it's a roomier sound. And you know, and like a lot of rock albums up until that point kind of leaned on the rooms a little bit to make it feel exciting. And um this was just like kind of felt weird that it was like a rock album that was felt like it had been made in like an anechoic chamber, you know? Um and it just felt like hollowed out in a way that was very unusual. Um and then um okay um so I, i'll keep going through gear here i guess um over here um i can see if the, if those two things at the bottom of the screen here uh, let me just unplug this so i can get a little closer these are called um level locks um and um if you uh you know if anyone has the sound toys plugins um you'd probably be familiar with the devil lock plugin um which is just like a radical compressor. It's basically like this insane limiter that um, just never gives up. Um, and these things, the Devil Lock is is based on these, um, and they were made by Sure. And it's I don't even know how they were used initially because they're so out of control that the most out of control compressor um, in the <laughs> ever made. I mean, you I can't even you you can't even um, like let you can't like if I have something going through them and um, I press stop for two seconds, the line noise the noise is just is as loud as whatever instrument was I was I was just recording. It's they're just definite. They're just the craziest things imaginable, um, and maybe people might feel like oh that's unusable, but I found that if you use them and then um, you can kind of like clean up around the edges and stuff like that, like cut out all the noise around them and stuff. And they can become very usable um, in a way that even compressors are not because they don't sound exactly like things are being compressed all the time. They just sound like it's up against your face in a way that um, it's like an, it's like impossibly close to you. Um, they're just very, very crazy. Um, and I think at some point that plugin was, Free. I mean, there was like a very low price or some, I think they were giving it away for free at some point or something, I think. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, I the plugin version definitely is cool, but it's not even, not even close to what these mm. are like. Like, it's just a different whole thing. I mean, that's what I feel like about a lot of plugins as like, just the same as I was talking about with the, the Fairchild, mm -hmm. that they are really cool, but they're not necessarily always feel like what it feels like to have the actual piece of gear. Right. And I use them both. I'm not like um, against the plugins by any means. I use plugins all day long, but um, there's just something about like, they're just different, you know, they're just diff different tools, you know, uh, even though it says the plugin says Fairchild on it, it's just different, you know, um, any piece of gear is probably going to be a little different than the plugin variation when you really AB it, you know, it's going to sound different. I mean, there's just no, the, I can't get the devil lock plugin to sound like, like those. It's just not, it's not the same thing. It's just, those are so crazy. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't overstate how crazy they are. Um, uh, here we go. We have um, the Eventide um, Ultra Harmonizer, which, you know, they've been, these have been in studios forever. Um, and um, I, I was never that interested in, 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 in like effect boxes like that for the longest time. I was kind of like, I was a little bit more just interested in what you could do with, um, you know, in reality, like if you're going to record a drum set, like what could I do to the actual drum set to make it sound different? What could I like, how could I mic it in a weird way? Or like, what, what, what how could you modify the drums so that they sounded different in, in real life? Um, and I felt like sometimes, you know, when you have effects boxes like that, even guitar pedals, that sometimes like it can make you feel get carried away with kind of effects. Um, and I'm not always so sure that um, I um, like I don't want to get carried away with effects because what happens is to me a lot of times when you're making an album that's just filled with effects, it becomes an effects album and that it becomes like it becomes so unrooted in reality that like um, that you can't really, 
you can't really relate to it in the same way as if like when you hear something that you can hear there's a there's a tangibility to it that people understand like I think the human ear just understands it better and and but then as I got like a little bit older I started like reading up more about like Brian Eno and stuff like that and the way um like Brian Eno and like Daniel Lenoir were using these kind of boxes on um like U2 recordings and stuff like that which U2 and, and things like that, they do have it, they do have they did have the ability to um feel like they were rooted in, in reality, but then they did have like this layer of like this feeling on top of it, like this ethereal kind of cloud. Um and I was kind of getting more and more interested in like that cloud and like what it what that like that feeling. And like, if you can like have those two worlds on top of each other, where, where it is this kind of raw recording and it does feel naturalistic. And then there's there's ways of like bringing in kind of that spectral otherworldly feeling on top of it. Then I, I started getting more interested in that stuff after like um, kind of reading a lot about Brian, you know, and, and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, I was listening to an interview with him and talking about it with Ed Daniel Lanois and about how with you too, like they really just, cause you know, he was like the more um, ambient synth, you know, um, experimental artsy type of person, you know, but uh, you know, but for some reason this band you too, who mostly had been like a new wave, sort of like a clat, wanted to sound like the clash or, but um, Brian Eno, yeah. And Lanois just took them in a completely different direction, you know, and like they became like, like you were saying, like ethereal, they could be ethereal and these like interesting synths and like weird strong sh song structures. And he definitely took them up a notch. And, and uh, yeah. yeah. And and so did he use that, that as well? The, the uh, Eventide? Is that why? Yeah, I just, yeah, he was like, they were big into that. And, and um, I mean, there's like an older version of, of, um, of a harmonizer here. Uh, mm -hmm. And this one, I mean, it's completely different than this one. Um, this one has a lot less features, but sounds basically completely different. Um, that one, like the older ones, I was like also getting really inspired by, um, well, also Brian, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, like if you've ever heard um, David Bowie's Low album, um, like David Bowie up until that point, you know, he, he had like that classic vibe you know, um, uh, but like we, when he went to Berlin, he did about, he did three albums in Berlin um, where Brian Eno was around. And um, it was like uh, that time they, I don't know what was going on in Berlin, but it was like, I mean, every, I mean, a lot of people know historically what was going on in Berlin around that time, which was pretty intense, but they were recording these albums in Berlin and they just sonically, it just everything changed. I think they were being inspired by those kind of German bands like Noi and and um, Kraftwerk and stuff like that. And I think that he, uh, David Bowie, initially went there to maybe work with some of those guys, and they didn't end up actually working together. But um, they were using like these Eventide harmonizers and stuff like that on um, like snare drums. Hmm. Like if you hear the Low album, almost immediately, like when you press play, you hear like the drummer hit a snare drum and like even to this day it still sounds crazy like it's just it's it's basically like a really fast delay with like the feedback kind of cranked a little bit and a, and like a pitch shifter on it so that like it just does this like kind of like cascading drop so like when it hits the snare drum it just yeah. and it's just a very peculiar sound um very like tied to that kind of era of David Bowie um and the first time I heard that album even like what well, I didn't obviously hear I'm too young but when I didn't hear it when it came out but I mean it must have been just magical to people when that first came out because it was so demented um and then when you read up stories like they were all trying to everyone was trying to all the producers were trying to figure out how he got this snare drum sound and so um yeah all that kind of like I mean, Brian Eno is just a very inspiring um, uh, producer. And like, when you just like read up about, you know, some of the, the craft of the um, record making that he, you know, he was involved with during that time. It's yeah. just like story by story. It's like super inspiring stuff that 
you can kind of go down a wormhole of like what was happening and why do these albums sound like this? And I feel like just like knowing that to me, knowing that stuff historically as like why things in the modern era sound a certain way and like kind of just like um, researching the way people were doing stuff with older gear and stuff like that. To me, I just find it super inspiring and interesting. Um, like that's the kind of like gear stuff that I kind of get into where it's like people that found new and unique ways to use it in a certain time period. And that those sounds like you kind of can't get those sounds exactly um, in the modern era in an easy way sometimes without going through like the rigmarole of like what they had to deal with to make sure it like, you know, to, to, to sometimes it's just, when you want to get something to sound a certain way, the harder way yeah, sometimes becomes the better way in a weird way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember like everyone, like with those Bowie albums, those Berlin albums, like everyone was just obsessed with those. And I, I remember I was reading somewhere that that was one of the reasons why Bono wanted to ask him. And it was, they didn't originally didn't want to produce you too, but Bono like basically begged them because he just was so loved what he did with David Bowie and everyone was just obsessed with that stuff in the mid seventies, those Berlin records. And yeah, it's pretty cool. But I wanted to actually ask you something real quick. Cause you were talking about the drums and how they, how they, uh, how Bowie would run through that uh, eventide harmonizer, but actually, so, so if people don't know, uh, you're a drummer, right. And so, um, and you, um, I remember you had a drum kit that, you know, uh, that you play and I think you were in a metal band and stuff, right. In high school. And, um, so anyway, so now I, I, I think I, the, you've th done some really cool things with drums that you've told me about over the years. And I remember one of them, so I was curious if you could maybe t share some of them. But one of them that I remember was, uh, I think when you did, was it the Alabama Shakes or, or was it Brittany Howard solo? But there was one where you put, so you do something that I was trying to actually explain to my students and I wasn't doing a good job one time, but you do something where you take like headphone you know, pretty commonly we'll take like headphone diaphragms and sort of take them out and then turn them into like drum, put them on drum heads and, and uh, use them as like wire them up as like microphones or whatever, right? Yeah. Like that kind of thing, which is very um, creative. Yeah, um, I don't know how I came across it. I think that, well, my dad was a musician and I, he must have known for some reason. I think what I, you know what I think it was, was that he had like a little reel to reel um, when I was young. And we wanted to record. And I think I remember him not having a microphone or something, or he did have microphones, but I think it was like one of those reel to reels that had like a quarter inch jack for the microphone. Um, and um, he didn't have one. So I remember he plugged in the headphones to the jack. Um, and I just saw him do it and then we recorded. And I remembered that, that headphones weirdly were could be used as microphones. So, you know, it's basically just a membrane that, you know, sends signal through the wire. Um, so it's just basically, it, 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 it could be used as a microphone, no problem. Um, and so I think that when I started recording, I had one of those like rolling digital machines when I was first recording my band. Um, and I wanted to record it. It had a certain amount of jacks that, that you could use as XLR, like a microphone input. And then there were like line inputs, I think. I can't even remember. Um, there were just quarter inch inputs. And I wanted to record my toms as well, but I didn't, I didn't have enough microphones and I didn't have the right jack. And I just remember I pl was plugging in the, the headphones into that unit. Um, and I so would you I, put them, how would you put them like physically on the drum? So would you like put well, one on I, one side, one on the other? I, or? I was just like, didn't know what I was doing. Right. You know, at that point in time, there was no like YouTube, like you couldn't, <laughs> there was no like mix videos, you know, it was just right. like, it was like wild, wild west, you know, you, there was no possible way to like know some of this stuff. I didn't know what to do. So yeah. I just strapped the headphone around the drum so that the membrane of the, of the headphone was like on the drum, um, basically like, uh like if i take this oh if this if this is a drum and this is the headphone i just would wrap it like this so that it was on lean it like onto the head of the drum so and it, and also 
it served two features like it also was like um like a muffle basically like instead of because i used to put on um like a little bit of like toilet paper and some tape onto the drum to like get it up like so it wasn't resonating so much but you didn't kind of need to do that once you wrapped a headphone around it it kind of just naturally kind of choked it a little bit which i kind of like the sound of and then i was recording it and it sounded like pretty crappy um at that you know for whatever i was recording at that time but i remember thinking it sounded kind of interesting um and then i just took this took <laughs> I, just, I just took that um you know in my head for a long time and then when i started recording stuff later in life and i was looking for different unique tones i just remembered that i had done that and i started doing it again but then i kind of got it in my head that like what if you recorded it like that and like when you do that it sounds pretty bad like if you just put a headphone on a drum and then like listen to listen to it coming up in pro tools it's like it sounds thin and not great but if then you were to go out into the room and say like oh what does this tom sound to me like what does it sound like to me in the room and then you go back and like listen to what's coming out of the headphone and then i started realizing like if i just eq'd it to like oblivion like I just kept cranking like a psychopath, like just hammering it so that I was trying to reproduce what I was hearing in the other room. Inevitably, you, I was getting a tone that was like closer to like the full body tone, like what I was hearing in the other room. But it was like, it just had a demented quality that was like completely different than, um, than anything I'd heard. Um, and so then, then I got really obsessed with it and I was just doing, I would like, similar to what I was talking about earlier of like having your back up against the wall, I would do it to myself on purpose where I would be like, how much of this can I get away with? Where like, I just start taking away all the microphones and I'm now left with only the headphones and like, how can I get a cool or interesting sounding drum set out of this situation? Um, and it was on the Alabama Shakes record. Um, there was a song called Guess Who? I don't know. I think that maybe I heard them playing it and it just sounded like small to me. Like it sounded, it had a tight, like tonal range. Um, and I, um, I thought it would be kind of interesting to record it like that. So I just did the whole entire drum set as like um, headphones um, and then recorded it just with the, the headphones. Um, and it, I think to me, it's like one of my favorite sounding drums on that album. Cause it was just, I felt at the time it was just like pretty unique. Um, uh, and when we were recording it, we were in Nashville and there was, um, there was a really famous engineer there, um, uh, who had done like a lot of big eighties stuff and like very hi-fi, very great sounding. And, and he was working in the other room across the hallway. and. Um, we got to know him sort of because, you know, in the hallway. And at some point he was like, oh, can I come hear what you're working on? And he came in the room and I, we were playing it. And I don't know what he was thinking, but like, it was definitely like super weird sounding. And <laughs> I, um, it wasn't, a, I mean, it, after that it was like mixed and stuff like that. But at the time it felt like it was even crazier because it had not been mixed or anything. And I remember thinking like, this man probably hates what he's hearing right now. But I also at the same time, like this weird feeling where like I felt so proud of it, which was like this weird thing where it's like, I'm so proud of how demented this sounds and that I'm playing it to this established person who might be hating it right now. And like, there was like a kind of sadistic quality to me that was like really into the fact that we were playing him this totally insane drum <laughs> bit. It's um, definitely not Steely Dan, right? It's not Steely Dan. Right? No, not even close. <laughs> um, and then um, I did, like, uh, recently, um, there's another band called Big Thief. And I was working with them on their last album. And there's a song, I think, called Blurred View or something. Um, and then again, I wanted to take it a step further. And I was like, this time, 100%. Like no instrument is going to touch this recording unless it's gone through like either a contact mic or a headphone, basically something that's like a membrane that's touching the instrument. Um, and so um, like a, a, the entire recording was done like a hundred percent that way without anything, um, 
with no microphones. Um, mm-hmm. And that was like another really fun um, journey into that. Yeah. <laughs> what was the one where, cause I heard actually, I think I heard Brittany Howard being interviewed on something, maybe it was Rick Rubin's podcast or something where she was talking about the, that session. And she was like, and she said something about how like, she was like, and then our engineer, Sean came out and said, okay, now you're going to play the drums with chopsticks. <laughs> was that right? Oh, yeah. Am I remember that correctly? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that, well, that was her for her solo album. Um, that was the solo one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, that I think wasn't done with headphones, but it was, um, her, her drummer is like one of the best drummers in the world. Like this, like super pro guy who has like the best drums around. And, um, also, I mean, there's like a bit of like a sadistic side of me that like <laughs> I like to kind of screw with people a little bit when I'm in this it's just I think it keeps everybody on their toes a little bit if you're doing something a little off you know and I think it I think even if people maybe seem against it it is inspiring in some ways to just be dealing with a situation that is like a little demented um and so because he's so good I kind of liked fucking with him a little bit because it was like I know this guy can do anything you know like I know he can. It like might not be what he wants to be doing, but like I know he can do whatever, ever mm-hmm. you know is happening. So, and um, yeah, that was just like years ago. I mean, also just an experiment, just like studio experiments was like I was trying to get. Well, I just noticed that sometimes there were certain drummers that were just hammering drums really hard, you know, and it just sounded like crap, really like when you're just pounding the daylights out of a drum set, it doesn't actually sound great because your cymbals are so loud, the drums are getting hammered so hard that it's just like, it's killing the note of the drum Mm. and there's no tone. It just sounds like transient information where like you can't actually hear a drum. It just sounds like basically like you might as well record claps. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it happens a lot in kind of like death metal music and stuff like that where it's just clicky and there isn't necessarily any tonal information that's coming out of it um but i mean and that can definitely work for metal music because there's a lot of noise and that things need to cut through but you know if you're recording like um kind of like vibier you know west coast fleetwood mackey music you kind of want as much tone as you can possibly get out of the instrument um and i think it was dealing maybe with sometimes with drummers that um that hit a little too hard And I was trying to find them smaller sticks so that they didn't, they weren't able to hit the drums as hard and I was able to get more tone out of it. So I just started finding smaller and smaller sticks to the point that one day, like there were some chopsticks and I had someone play with the chopsticks and suddenly it sounded like just incredible. Like, because if you mic it well and you EQ it in a way that feels like full bodied, you know, there's a lot of information even in a chopstick more information because you're you're just like you're once you start miking something that's that being that's that quiet and you start pulling all that information out of it there's a lot there you just have to kind of pull it out of out of there and i just it noticed that those chopsticks can sound incredible um and so when we were recording this song it wasn't that he was hitting too hard this guy knows exactly what he's doing but it just sounds, I just knew that chopsticks can sound cool if mic'd properly, you know, if mic'd in a way that, that gets as much information out of the drum as possible. And this is a regular drum kit or is this a customized drum kit for this? That purpose? drum kit, I think that was on that song was, was customized by me because it was all snare drums. It was like, I think it was just a hundred percent snare drums. Um, the kick drum was a snare drum. The, <laughs> all, the to- all the toms were snare drums. Everything was a snare drum um so this kick drum pedal hit a snare drum yeah i just put it up against some cement um like bricks um so that it couldn't go anywhere and then like a kick drum pedal on the onto the snare drum huh and then would you layer it with like samples later or uh, no 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 i try to get all the information out of it what i do is like if i'm recording a drum and i want it to sound like maybe like a beefier sample a lot of times when I'm recording the drum, I'll like A, B it with like a beefy sample um, and try to EQ it so that it matches the sample. Like I'll just keep screwing with it until I get the amount of information that I want out of it. I think that samples, to be honest, I feel like 
obviously, I mean, I've used them, everyone uses them, but like, I really try not to because like, um, I think you can go down a wormhole of like adding the, it just, you get lost. And I think what it does is it can end up just sounding more and more fake. And even though you might not think it does, I think the human ear has like an incredible understanding of what it's hearing, even if it doesn't know what it's hearing. Like, I think that you know it's fake. I think you can tell. Yeah. Um, like when you hear a drum set that has been recorded in, a, in like, like, you know, just been recorded in a, in a, in a, like a proper, not a proper, it's the wrong word, but in a way that's full bodied and, and, you know, filled with information people know, I think they can tell. Um, I think they can tell. And I think that like referencing stuff with samples is like a cool way to get uh, acoustic drums to sound fresh because like you're, you're then competing with um, people that are using samples, but you're, you're um, coming at it from a different angle. And that different angle gives you kind of like a leg up because like you are, hitting all the same like frequency ranges as they are. Like you are accessing all that same information that a hip hop record would be accessing, but you're doing it with acoustic instruments. And I think it's just, for me, it's a matter of EQing and like experimentation to get it to the point that it sounds like maybe the, the, the same way. And when I, when I get it, I mean, I don't always get it, but like when you do get it, it feels very gratifying that you could, that you're like, oh, you're competing with this kind of album, but you're not doing it the same way. Interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's a really neat way to, to approach it. Do you find yourself using other samples at different times or uh, is it more? Um... Honestly, like when I'm like produce, I mean, when I'm mixing something, I mean, there's, it's uh, like filled with samples and stuff and I'm, I'm dealing with what people are giving me. Um, but when I'm recording or producing something myself, Honestly, I try my hardest to not be touching that stuff. I never open splice or um, I don't do, I don't touch. The taps the transient stuff. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, like in adding a sample in. Um, yeah. No, for sure I do. Yeah. But like, I really try not to. Like I, yeah. I, try, I try my hardest not to. Like I will, I will go out of my way to try any kind of experiment I possibly can. To, to make sure that I'm, cause I feel like if I can do it without it, I feel like I'm gonna get it more interesting than if I start adding snare drums that people have heard before. And like this, it's, it's just gonna be more unique because you made it, you know? Um, and, and yeah, I think I, I just, I try not to. I mean, it's just something I try not to do cause I just don't wanna be, I just don't wanna be like, I just don't want to have anything in the song that, that other people have, have heard before because, you know, they have access to the same thing. That, and especially in the modern world where we all have access to the, you know, internet and like samples and great sounding weird little nuggets of sound and things like that mm -hmm. and bass drops and all that stuff. And it's like, I feel like, but what people don't have access to is my studio and like the microphone or it's not that my studio is special. I, I literally mean like, anyone's situation is special because like you are in your own unique circumstance where you can make something that is just different than what someone else is making so like if it's coming from your this your this, the source where you are in it's going to have a more unique quality than if you're outsourcing pieces of information from the internet um you know does that change a little when you uh mix something that you didn't record uh, does your approach change a little? Uh, it has to a little bit because like sometimes like people have built a certain drum sound on a sample and I just don't, I mean, like, I, can't, I mean, they, they, right. they're already, they've already been listening to it for six months and it's, it's like, it just is what it is. Like I can't really do anything about it, but um, uh, even then, like if I see it like a, like a sample of it, the, I, one of my biggest problems is like snare drum samples. Like I know it like works really well in like a hip hop environment where you have like a one with all. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's just like the sound of that. Even that, like what I want out of like, for me personally in music is like a little bit of more variation in like the 
um, dynamic of a, of a sound. It's not just the dynamic because like you can, you can trigger a snare sample that has different dynamics, but like there's an infinite amount of information that's like in that one snare drum hit. And if one drummer hits a snare drum the second time, there's an infinite amount of different information in the second. You know, a couple can have billions of children and each one's gonna be different, um, but like you're never gonna have the same kid twice. And so that's kind of what I feel like about snare drum samples is like that's, the snare drum is like one of the things in music that like carries so much information in it and is so loud in modern music that like, at least in the snare drum, I want to hear some degree of variation so that like I'm interested as a listener and it's not just the same thing over and over again because I feel like I'm just going to lose my mind like hearing the same thing over and over again. And we're used to it now because modern music has drum machines and it's, and it, and, but I'm, to be honest, I'm kind of bored of it hmm. and I just want more information than that. And so even when I have just like a sampled snare drum I'll, I'll, what I'll usually do is I'll pipe it out to an amp in the other room and I'll put a snare drum in front of the amp and then record the, the snares so that even though it's like one snare drum sample, I'm like re-recording the actual snare information um, and then layering that into the sample. So you are getting like some degree of like humanity. You are getting air you're adding like a, some element of air into like an otherwise like kind of rigid sample. And like just that little bit of information that like kind of subtle extra like reality um, to me is really important and ends up being like so useful. And like, I think that when people hear that they don't even really know what they're hearing but they're understanding that there's some degree of humanity in there that they don't really know what what is happening. Mm. Um, I think it's just all those little like things to me are, are 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 like a big difference interesting yeah and so you, you, what you do is you, you what you were saying you like put a speaker up in the studio and a snare drum in front of the speaker is yeah. that what you said? and then you and then you sort of uh route the speaker track through that and then you mic it it's almost like yeah. reamping a snare re or something yeah there was like um i just did this thing in france last year with the mix of the masters thing and i did a seminar and I was showing the people in the seminar reamping re snare drums, um, and um, and I got like two like two weeks later, this famous drummer that I know like sent me uh, an Instagram message, and he was like, "Dude, check this trick out," and it was like someone reamping a snare drum. <laughs> and he was like, "Isn't it sick?" And I was like, "Yeah, I do that. I do that." And then like the video pans up, and it was the guy I just showed it to in France and it had like gone viral and it had like 30,000 views. I was like, I just showed this guy this. <laughs> <laughs> They're not even giving you credit. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's funny. Yeah. Do you think cause your background as a drummer you just sort of take it especially like you have a sort of very thorough knowledge and you take it seriously and uh, in that way? Yeah, I, I think so to some, I mean, I was never like a, like a drum Nazi. Like I didn't like, I wasn't like a nerd about like what drums I own and stuff like that. I'm like, like a lot of people get into like, oh, I have this like 1978 Ludwig and like, oh, it's got, if you tune it this way and blah, blah, blah. And like, that's cool. And I'm like, I'm all into it. But like, for some reason, my brain doesn't just, doesn't get off on it. Um, my dad does, like he totally is obsessed with that stuff. Um, He's a drummer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that like my, him being into that made, I mean, I think I was partially, maybe my kind of obsession with making sure the drums sound a certain way is to make sure that when my dad hears it, he's like stoked. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, yeah, that could be where it's coming from. But I mean, definitely like my, like my take on it um, um, is that, uh, my 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 take on it is that uh um at my angle i guess is that i like to come at it not necessarily like from like what era the, what, what the exact drum i'm using but like what unique way of of recording it or or how we could play with and manipulate it you know in a way that kind of felt fresh or something like that that's cool yeah mm -hmm. super interesting um 
Cool. So was that all you wanted to show us around the studio? Just to, I want to make sure we don't miss anything. Oh yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here, but I mean, I guess each piece of gear brings up a different kind of conversation. Uh, Fair I mean, enough. I don't know how, um, how you want to structure the conversation or if people will have questions or anything like that. Yeah. You know, if people have questions, they're welcome to, to chime in or um... is your studio specifically a remix studio or are you tracking there also um i'm tracking that space. well I, I mean if uh you want to see for one second i can walk into the bigger room yeah. um, um here i'll switch my camera around um uh, sorry it's gonna be dark for one second Um, so here's like the main room. Um, so um, this is where there's a dog. Um, this is where I do more tracking. Um, but I don't do as much tracking um, as uh, as I, I I mean as I would like. Uh, so much of it is mixing that it ends up being more more mixing stuff. But um, I still use this room pretty much every day, just at least to be like reamping or or you know doing some some kind of weird thing. Um, but yeah, this is more of the tracking space. Is it? Um, it looks like a nice sounding room. Does it have a nice big sound for the drums? Yeah, it sounds incredible in here. I mean, it was never really treated to be a studio exactly, but um, just the way that I mean there's a lot of just kind of random surfaces and it's just kind of naturally sounds pretty good. And then I noticed that when I was in some of these classic studios in Hollywood, that they're essentially built the exact same way. I mean, when you look up, they're kind of the same kind of bow truss buildings and some of them just have different, like kind of, you know, basically like walls inside of these walls, but um, they're, they're basically the same kind of rooms yeah what's the floor made of um oh it's just cement but i mean when i'm tracking with a band it will be um it will be rug i'll put rugs and stuff out um so people can you know set up easier and then that changes the sound a little bit what does the sign say above is that band? It's a, no it says bell sound studios which is not the, not the name of my studio it's just uh I found that in an antique shop, so um, yeah, it came in. Is there? Do you have you named the studio? Do you have a name? Um, people call it Subtle McNuggets, but I never actually named it that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Subtle McNuggets. Yeah. <laughs> you might get question in that. the chat. Mm -hmm. What are your three favorite things in this room besides the doggo? Oh, uh, uh, good question. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, uh what are my three favorite things um well <laughs> to be honest this crappy pa uh pvpa which i've made probably more use of than anything in this room because almost every day i i send um kind of sound into this room um and then i have one of those neumann binaural heads um, and then i just kind of move that around the room um and reamp stuff back into this room and and capture it and kind of blend it in with the kind of close mic stuff and when i'm when i'm mixing something um that can be really useful because you can get a kind of lot of um kind of reality out of out of it by just reamping it into a big room like that i mean you can use like plugins like that ocean way plugin um to do a similar thing um which is really good um but I mean, since I have access to this larger space, um, I just find it is it's nice to um, to be able to 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 use that. Um, you have your own echo chamber there. Yeah, it's not quite an echo chamber because it doesn't sound like you know reverb really. It's mostly it. I think of it more as like reality. Hmm. You know? It's just like a, it's a room mic, and it just like if I have um, the ability to. Um, just add a little bit of reality to everything. Um, to me, it feels a little bit cooler. Yeah. Uh, um, what else is? Another comment in the chat, space is the place. Space is the place. Well, 
uh, echo space. Uh, there's an echo. There's a space echo. <laughs> um, these are always cool, you know, an old space echo. Um, oh, wow. A real one. Yeah, like an old. I mean, this one's not old. I do have an old one. I mean, it looks old because it's dusty. But um, uh, yeah, just these old space echoes are really incredible. Um, That's the tape based one? Yeah, tape based. They just sound really, really cool. And one of the cool things you can do with these is that it's a good way of getting like a crappy tape sound without spending money on like a like serious money on like a big tape machine is that if you have one of these this these t these tapes inevitably sound pretty fried um and so sometimes when i'm uh, wanting to get like a kind of cool tape vibe off of something um i just turn down i turn up the mix um all the way so um i'm just getting the the tape and then i record whatever instrument through it and just the tape and then because it's a delay it's delayed so then you just have to move it back in time in the in whatever daw you're working in and um and break and put it back in time but then all of a sudden you've got like a really cool tape sound um so yeah that's that's a cool one christina made another comment about odd harmonics uh, oh, for the win is that from the tape? i saw that uh, I think it was odd harmonics for the win. I think referring to um, like once you put something through it, like a, a tape situation like that, you're getting a lot of odd harmonics and um, you're getting a cool sound out of it. <laughs> a Got winning. It. That's right. That's yeah. how you win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you replace those tapes periodically or does the cumulative? Usually only win? when they are so broken that I that can they're no longer um even usable um yeah. I, like even on my I mean I have a, a 24 track um uh tape machine that's usually in here um and um even that I I, I keep the same reel of tape on it for probably even a year um I'll just keep reusing it reusing it reusing it I'm I'm actually trying to get it to get a little bit fried um because to me that's what I want out of tape is something different. I mean, if I want it to be pristine, I can reuse Pro Tools, but um, I want to have, that's why I record, that's why when I was talking about earlier when you record the two sort, the, the source twice, is that like I do have a clean version of whatever. And then I have this more fried tape version. And then I have a choice. Um, I'm not trying to get hi fi information out of tape for most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. I mean, it's super interesting too. I mean, multi-tracking like that. How much is tape now, by the way? I don't even know, like a 24 track. Well, I haven't tape. bought it in quite a while because I, I have, there's probably 30 reels here and I just keep going through them. Um, last time I bought it, it was like, I think it was about $200 a reel. Um, I think it might've gone up a little bit since then even. Yeah. I, I could be wrong. I haven't bought tape in a little while. When I was and studying then, audio in college at Chico State, we, we had a tape machine for my first semester there. And I remember, I think it was like 125. It was a lot because it's only like, what, 15 or 30 minutes of yeah. music, right? So Yeah, depending on what speed you're recording at. But um, the um, uh, there's these producers around town that know that I like tape and they keep selling off their tape machines and, and getting rid of their, their tapes. And so people just keep showing up here with tape um, and I keep just getting given because, you know, a lot of people aren't using it. So I just keep, people just keep giving it to me. I've been lucky. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, I want to ask a little bit more about going back to BAMP Center because, um, you know, we we're talking a little bit about like, because uh, you and I started there at the same time. And mm -hmm. I was curious, maybe after I left, but um, but yeah, and also I'll, I'll just say I, I remember <laughs> in hindsight very much appreciated <laughs> your friendship at the time because like um, like you oh, know I I just like was totally new up there and you know we hung out all the time and members going to your family's house getting to your family and um, mm -hmm. and then I remember also this is probably TMI but going through like a breakup a pretty bad breakup. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> that this girl like first time I'd ever been like in love, big relationship. Mm -hmm. And then she came up and then like broke up, dumped me. <laughs> so yeah. I was I was a mess. I remember but, that. Yeah, yeah. But uh -huh. definitely appreciated, you know, 
your friendship and all of that. So, so. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I had basically, I mean, I think I was 17 or just turned 18. Yeah. Um, and, um, I, I had just left home as well. So I didn't have, um, I mean, I didn't have any friends up there. I didn't know anybody. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it was like a, a bit of a, uh, I mean, that was like a life changing event actually for me, um, was like ending up in that, um, in that school and um uh it was yeah it was just it was like a it changed my life completely i mean that that was really the beginning of everything that followed um and it was pretty random because i didn't i mean i i hadn't applied weirdly it was like you know the semester had already started and someone had dropped out and like i had just been there so they needed someone quickly and i just ended up in the program and um and uh, I think at that time, like, I mean, I didn't have any friends up there either. So it was like, I was lucky to have, have met you because, you know, I mean, everyone else else there was like so deeply rooted in, in the classical world that like, I didn't really have um, any kind of pop cultural references that I could kind of communicate yeah. to them about. Um, and and I could with you. So that was, um, that was, pretty uh, uh that was am amazing for me to be honest yeah <laughs> yeah same yeah, yeah. and I, I remember um i think also because you were at like 18 but i was like 22 or 23 but i think mm -hmm. most of the people there were closer to 30 ish right like other like, yeah i think I mean, people. Like people that were 40 yeah like john um, probably was yeah definitely um and uh, yeah i mean so like yeah it was like a, I felt so i mean and everybody there knew what they were doing and I really didn't like, I was just into experimentation, but like, as far as like, you know, like, you know, designing a patch bay, I was like completely over, it was completely over my head. I had no clue. I remember there was like, um, that guy, I think it was like, uh, Kyung Quinn was there. Mm -hmm. he was um, roommate. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Um, and he, um, I just felt like he knew everything. Like he, you know, he was so, educated about like I remember like he was designing equipment or I think he worked for like GML or something or something afterwards and I just felt like I was like how am I in the same group of people as this guy like he just, this guy just, like really seems like he's on his his game and I'm like just lost completely you know um well that program has a connection with that McGill grad I think Kyung Kwe and some of the other people were in the graduate program at McGill right I think so yeah that was even more educated than I was at that time. Oh yeah, they, there were so many like heavily educated people there, and to be honest, that, that was really good for me. Um, I feel like the, the situations in my life that have been the most rewarding for me are when I felt like I was so in over my head that like I was doomed, yeah. and coming out of that situation, like you know, just like if you're able to like pretend your way through it by the time you kind of make it through that that really um is a, a game changer my god that's the that's the i feel like the only time i learn anything really it was kind of like ideal i think especially for somebody like you where you, you were just able to just have hands on like day and night studio hands on you didn't have to like it was paid for by the canadian government mostly the band yeah. center right and it was like this perfect like sort of educational uh tool for you because you could just keep doing it and you did it for years there right how long were you there four years four years yeah i mean i couldn't have i mean i couldn't have designed a better situation for me at that point in my life like there's absolutely no way I, anything better could have happened i mean you could i could have gone to some recording school and like you would have been like classes and like i would have paid a bunch of money and been broke and stuff like that but like they were paying me I had access to studios 24 hours a day. I was with a bunch of people that were like way more knowledgeable than me. I was being thrown into situations that I had, I had no business being thrown into. And like, it was just like the best possible thing that could have happened. I mean, like, I, I can't, I can't even believe that that happened. <laughs> Are you still in touch with Teresa? Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't talked to her in about a year, but I need to, I need to talk to her again. I mean, yeah. I, for Pretty people much. that don't know, Teresa Leonard uh, was ran the audio program at the Banff Center at the time, 
and she was my all of our boss and she um very very wonderful like a really good mentor for mine like she wrote letters of recommendation for me for many years after that and then now she actually runs the aspen uh music festival uh sound program as well but she just lives over right over here in victoria right is she in yeah, that's right yeah yeah uh, she's um yeah she's she easily changed my life more than any human being mm -hmm. on earth right. <laughs> yeah Teresa Easily. Leonard for the win. He was also the um, head of the AES at one point. That's the right. President. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, okay. So we talked about BAMF. So talk about um, going out to LA. Can you talk a little bit about like that? And I'm curious about how, how that happens and um, who were the people maybe that were helped you along the way? And what, what maybe what are some things you wish you had done differently? <laughs> but like, like, yeah, I'm curious to know about like, I feel like about like that next transition. Well, I was just, you know, I was in Banff and um, lots of other things happened. I got involved with this like famous Canadian boy group that I was recording and playing drums for and went on tour with briefly and it, just an insane situation. The Moffats, um, right? They were the Moffats. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then I, you know, I was doing that and then I was back in Banff and like, um, and it was all very like enriching and like I had learned a lot. But then at some point I was just kept looking at the record sleeves of my favorite albums and noticing the trend that everything was recorded in LA. Um, and a guy that was in this band with me, um, he had this dream to move to LA. And I think I also got it in my head because one of the um, key people in Banff that was kind of the head of audio engineer was a man named John Sorensen who had worked in Los Angeles and had worked on, you know, albums that were some of my favorites like like Beck and stuff like that he did um, mutations I think and then Red Hot yeah. Chili Peppers Californication he was the assistant engineer yeah and those were like the albums that like you know were very popular and cool yeah. at that time and um um and so I'd heard these stories of him being in Los Angeles and and you know assisting in these studios and and the idea of working in one of these studios just became like a fairy tale to me. Like it was like Valhalla, you know, like that was the 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 thing to do, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was just I was like there, I mean as a Canadian citizen, it, it's almost felt hopeless like how am I supposed to to do that? Um, you know, you have to have someone vouch for you and like how do you do that when you don't know anybody down there? Um, but it just so happened that um one of the people that had been to the BAMP Center before that was a man named Mark Wilshire who had gone down and started working in like film soundtracks. Um, and he did a lot of the work on, on recording the um, Lord of the Rings soundtracks. Um, and he had somehow met that man, Eric Ballantyne, who made those compressors. Um, and um, uh, he was telling me there's this producer, you know, he did the Queens of Stone Age record. And I feel like you'd really, you know, get along with him and you would like him. So actually when I went to, um, there was an, a couple of different AES uh, conventions in LA. And um, when I had come here, I I'd somehow contacted him and we'd been chatting and, and I got along with him and he was like, come over, you know, this day or whatever. And I just kind of hung out with him. And every time I would go down to LA, I would just kind of visit him and, um, he was very nice to me. And he said, you know, if, if, you know, if you're ever down here at some point, um, maybe you can help me assist on some stuff or something like that. And I took that very seriously. And I was, so I got in my head, I was like, I'm going. And I, 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 I mean, I was still quite young and I wouldn't do this nowadays, but I mean, I don't even think you could do this nowadays, honestly, now with like the way that they've, the way that they, the government has, has, us, uh, has us all, you know, in their computer systems. But I just, you know, showed the border guard my um, driver's license and I drove here. Um, I didn't have a visa or anything. I just was like completely just, I mean, I think I had a thousand dollars to be honest. I, I was like, really, it was a, it was a hairy situation. Um, but I got here and I called up Eric again and he said, um, actually, um, I'm sorry, my assistant never left. So I don't have any opportunities for you. And I was like, oh no. Um, so I was kind of felt like I was screwed for a second, but then he um, called me like an hour later and he was like, you know, a friend of mine is starting an album tomorrow and he's um, kind of in a situation where he didn't hire an engineer. He was like, do you think you could help him? And I was like, 
sure. And, he, and so he gave me this guy's address. I went to his house and I met with him and that ended up being um, Tony Berg. <laughs> who was like one of the biggest a and r people of the 90s like signed weezer and all this stuff um and i just hit it off with him and and started recording the next day um an artist pete yorn who was, i was also a big fan of um and it just was like a, just another situation where i kind of you know took a, this crazy risk and um it ended up being like one of the biggest opportunities of my life because through that situation is where everything kind of happen so you weren't even assisting you were like you you recorded it you engineered it yourself or were you yeah assisting? i went down there to assist for some people yeah and i immediately started engineering like it was like uh it was a miracle to be honest um complete miracle i mean there's no i had no business engineering the same thing happened at vamp center i was hired as an assistant um and um i was supposed to fill the pencils every week or something like that i did <laughs> and i got in trouble they called me into the office and they were like, you didn't do the pencils again. You wrote on the, um, you know, the sheet, you're writing on the sheets in red marker. You drew a picture on the take sheet. You know, that's a big no, no, you shouldn't have been doing that. And I was like, you know what? Like, I think maybe like I, I shouldn't be assisting. Like I should probably be engineering. And, in, and out of the meeting, instead of like firing me, they promoted me. <laughs> This is uh, Teresa and John and, and yeah. Amp, yeah. Um, so then I became one of the engineers, but I was originally there supposed to be there as assistant. So somehow I've dodged being an assistant. My <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> um, yeah. That's um, funny. Yeah. So in any case, that's that's how I kind of ended up in in LA. So how'd you end up in this studio here specifically? Well, then I mean, I just worked like a maniac for. Um, uh eight years or something like that um and just started meeting more and more people and like you know the thing is is that like when you do one thing that people like that can get you jobs and if people like the th that thing that you did then that can get you other jobs and then that is a, it's those little branches that that keep kind of growing is what I, what i found is that like every time there's an album and I can kind of feel it sometimes when you worked on something and it's like, okay, well, I feel like this is actually like people are like, this is working in a different way that a lot of the other things I've worked on didn't, you know? Um, and I'm getting calls now to do something based on this recording and, and you knowing like, okay, well that worked. And so kind of having like this running tally of like, okay, this feeling works, you know, <laughs> people like it when, you know, you do this, you know, and it's kind of like navigating what it is that, what it is about record making that I feel like people respond to and like the trial and error of different projects and being like, well, that didn't work. That why did this work and why did this not work? And all those different branches led to um, more and more work. And that I um, eventually just saved and saved and saved and saved and saved all those years, I think what I was doing was, I, I can't remember what percentage it was, but I think I, I was like, I was like trying to save, I think it was maybe 50, 50. I was trying to save 50% of everything I made and put it into a bank account where I couldn't touch it. But I was like eating like ramen noodles and like stuff uh, basically along the way. I was pretty much living in poverty, knowing that I had a bunch of money stored in this other thing so that I could save it. And then I, when I had enough to put a down payment down, I found this warehouse. And at that time, downtown LA was still pretty screwed. Um, and so I was able to get a pretty good deal on it. Um, and then since then, this the, it, the, the area has completely changed and um, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. But um, at the time it was like, I just saved enough that I was able to put a down payment down and then um, ended up in, the, in this space. The loft. And you, because yeah. you also live there, right? So that's where you, you and your family live there. And then it's yeah. also the studio. Yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a warehouse that's been converted in kind of two, two ways. Yeah. And then are there other, like, do you have rentals too? Like, is it a whole business or is it just you? No, it's just okay. me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a great studio. I remember like, it's, uh, you know, right there downtown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Crazy area to be in. Yeah. <laughs>
so okay so i have, I have one i have a couple of specific questions but i wanted to ask about some work that you've done that i've never been able to ask but um so for here's one actually and this is something i'm asking kind of for my students because uh we use altaverb and so we really like altaverb and stuff and i know you also use altaverb right yep. and so mm -hmm. um i was curious because i was listening to uh so i guess this is a two-part question i was listening actually to that adele song that you worked on and so and i was particularly admiring the reverb and oh, so i was curious i was curious about like first of all i guess how that record came about and how that went if there was anything if you had any stories there or whatever but then also about the reverb and maybe some alter verb tips like what are some of your favorite like presets and tips and tricks and stuff like that um the uh that uh, well a friend of mine actually another canadian um when right when i first came to la i was doing this album with like a local band and there was this bass player who I caught along with and I just liked this guy, he was funny. Um, and he was Canadian, so we had something in common. Um, and he um, he was also illegal at that point. Um, and he was trying to figure out how to stay in America and he was struggling and he was living on like a, a mattress somewhere in, in also in downtown, but further down into like even sketchier zone. Um, and then he eventually had to go back up to Canada. And during that time, he had originally been working to be in a band, but like during that time, he decided to learn piano and started writing like songs, you know? Um, and he put out an album. Um, well, he recorded an album and he put it out and um, people started really responding to his songs and somehow Adele heard it. Um, and really liked his songwriting and so i guess what the thing what happened was is that she called him to england to go write um a song with her hmm. um and i was in new york and i was getting on a plane i was on a plane and i thought and i'd fallen asleep on the tarmac and um and then when i woke up it, the plane hadn't gone in it gone anywhere um and I thought we were in LA, but we weren't, we were still in New York. And I was like, and then they were telling everyone to get off the plane. And I was like, oh my God, look, this is crazy. It was like 4 a.m. and I was getting off the plane and then first class was my, my friend, you know? I was like, dude, what are you doing here? Like, I couldn't believe, I was like, what are you doing? Cause I thought he was still up in Canada. He was like, dude, you wouldn't believe it. He was like, I was just in England and Dell heard my songs and I wrote a song with her. And I was like, what? And so then um, he, uh, he, that album, that, that was two albums ago and it came out and he had one of the singles and it was like life-changing for him, like totally life-changing. And as soon as you write a song with Adele, um, you know, your career as a songwriter is completely changed, you know, like now, like he's like one of the busiest songwriters in LA. In fact, he like, I just like attended the last, Grammys and watched him win songwriter of the year at like this first time they've ever announced a songwriter of the year and he won it what's his um, name again Tobias Gesso Jr hmm. um and what happened was for this album he had she'd asked him again to write a song with her and he, a friend of his had this mansion up in um the Hollywood Hills somewhere and they they liked he liked to go there with Adele and write because they had Philip Glass's piano in this mansion cool. um, and they loved the piano. And so, and there was this big room that she liked singing in. And so they wrote this song and then they were trying to record it. And I guess it was extremely difficult for her to sing. Um, like she was like, it needed to be a very specific vibe for her to get into, to actually be able to do it the way that she wanted to do it. And so they were going around to studios and they were having a hard time and so one day he, I got an emergency call from him. He was like, dude, I need to record this song. He's like, I can't figure it out. Like, I need to record the song. It needs to be in this mansion. He's like, do you know how to make this mansion sound good? And I was like, I'm sure there's a way. And so I, I went there and it was like this big room. And um, basically I ended up bringing that Neve and I brought a whole Pro Tools rig headphone system, like the nicest mics. I rented like the craziest mics ever. Um, and then set up like basically like a full recording studio in this mansion. Like it was like, you could record like pretty much any situation in this mansion. And then what I did 
was I figured I was like, okay, well, that song "Hello" that Adele recorded is out in the world. People hear it. People, you know, she obviously approved it because it's like out. And so I had my friend Tobias go come and play piano, and then we hired a. Actually, it was a guy who can sing as loud and project as much as she she can because she's a really loud singer like she's like a guitar amp like there's like you know she projects in a way that's just incredible like most people can't do that and so this guy could project like she could and so I basically recorded hello again in that room with Tobias playing piano and, and him doing it and the reason I did that was because if I dialed it in to match hello like I could match the tones of hello, the piano tone, the vocal tone, everything. Then I looked what microphones they were using. I looked up everything. I was like, if I can get it in that ballpark where I'm a being with hello, and it sounds like I have a sound alike. When she walks in here and she records this new song, which is also piano vocal, I'm going to be in the ballpark of something she's previously approved. And so when I was researching that, um, the guy who mixed it um, had used, um, actually, I, I, um, I knew him. Uh, I do know him. Um, it's a guy named Tom Elmhurst. And he really likes the setting on the Eventide that I was showing earlier called Canyons. Um, and I think he must darken the vocal a little bit before he sends it into the Canyon setting. Um, and it creates this kind of like, it's almost not even a reverb, this thing. It's like, it almost sounds like a pad like it takes, it's like such a long trail and it does like this really kind of beautiful thing with it where it almost sounds like it's like a, it's kind of like this, this like, it's like a pad underneath the vocal that's made of the vocal. Um, and so um, I saw that, but through looking up what he, he did, or I think maybe even he told me, um, um, oops, sorry, um, sorry, what's going on here? I pressed a button. Um, um, uh, uh, through that, um, I saw that he'd use this canyon setting. So I brought the eventide down and, and I basically just, it was basically copying, you know, because, and that's not something I would normally do in a recording, but like, I was like, I need to make sure that this is bulletproof and that when she walks in, she could put the headphones on and it sounds like you know, a hundred bucks, you know? <laughs> um, uh, and, and I thought like, if I'm using this as a reference point, then that's like a really good way to know that I'm in the ballpark of something that she's comfortable with. And um, did it work out that way? Was she pleased and did everything go okay? Yeah, I mean, it was, she, there was no problems at all. She came in and like put the headphones on, she could sing in front of the microphone. There was no issues at all because it was just like, and it was, it was an environment for her that she could be so comfortable and like we were there for a couple of days and she could just do take after take. And it was just, there was no technical issues at any point because it had been so worked out that like, I never even needed to say like, could you just test the mic? Could you do uh, nothing? Like there was no aggravation whatsoever. It was just so easy. You know, all she had to do was just sing, you know, she could have a little drink later. It was just like, it was relaxed. You know, there was no studio environment, people running around. It was just easy, mm. you know? That's yeah. cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I was listening to it. It's really good. Yeah. It is a unique reverb, you know, when I listen to it, it's pretty cool. And that's the Eventide. Is that the hardware or was that a plugin that you were talking about? That was the hardware. The hardware. Yeah. 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 But you do sometimes use Altiverb, right? But maybe not that time. Yes. No, I was like, I just needs to be the one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No impulse responses of even tides. You wanted the real thing. Yeah, no, this is definitely this was gonna be the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, so then outside of that session, I was just curious, like what are some of your favorite like presets? And do you have any like altiverb things you do that are kind of cool? Like um, yeah, altiverb. Um, there's a setting I've been using for years as just like a naturalistic thing, like kind of like the way that I was talking about just amping stuff into the room. There's something called Call's Place, I think, C-O-L-L Place, that I've been using for a super long time. And then actually one day I was watching a Mix with the Masters video with um, this guy, Chad Blake, who's like one of my favorite mixers. And um, randomly he brought up that he, like one of his favorite settings was this Call's Place. And I was like, 
I'll be damned. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, that's the, my favorite one. I've been thinking about that one for forever. Is it a room? I haven't used that one. Is it like a... Yeah, it's someone's living room. It's mm. a someone's living just room. Just call. call. I really, yeah, I just like C-O-L-L. It just sounds great. It's a great living, great sounding room. Um, yeah, for th those of you that don't know, like it's it's a convolution reverb. So it's made of these impulse responses where people will uh, go in with like a microphone and the speaker <laughs> And then you just play t test sounds and you record it through the speaker. And then it goes into the software, which creates these, what are called impulse response files that you can then load in to the software. And then it's the same kind of reverb and then you can manipulate it. So you can like change the decay time, the tone, it's pretty powerful. You know, yeah. everything from like Carnegie Hall to, you know, calls place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> calls yeah. Hall. Yeah, or actually, some of the cooler ones are the toys. You ever use any of those? That, that you, yeah, you use like ray guns and toys and stuff too, right? Yeah, I mean, the ones I use most often are probably like the spring reverbs and the um, like amp reverbs and like the sometimes like the the ones that are based on some of like the kind of gear um, plates, like use the, the plates at all. Reverbs and the springs and the I I really like those things. Those are cool, and I mm. and I I also weirdly use the Notre Dame a lot. I don't know why. I just like, it's just a very long, intense church vibe. And, and I, I, it's very dark and spooky. I mean, it's, it's not for everything because like a lot of times, most music doesn't call for a 30 second reverb, but I mean, when it does. <laughs> <laughs> Notre Dame, yeah. Actually, I was just reading about how, cause you know, Bert, there was, I had the big fire there a few years ago. Yeah. And so, but I think now they're talking about when they rebuild it, it is going to sound different. So I was reading an article about the sound itself. So you yeah, may luckily, have like a the pre luckily, pre fire. Yeah, yeah. Was that impulse vintage, responses? Vintage Notre Dame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, do you ever use the uh, the one I like to is the um, the pyramid one? Oh yeah, that one's cool. That one's nuts. You just really have to like shorten it, but it's yeah. if you shorten it a lot, it actually sounds pretty nice. Yeah, there's a bunch of um, settings inside of that area that sound really cool um the uh um where is that area i can't remember d d where is that that weird oh mausoleum zone yeah everything inside of the mausoleum zone is, is uh the <laughs> <is laughs> goal there's like a goal gumbaz or something that sounds um pretty cool <laughs> It's all those coffins and mummies yeah. and stuff absorbing the sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one more specific question, and then maybe we can open it up to, if anyone else has any questions. But I was also going to ask about, because um, you know, you kind of, a lot of people know you won a Grammy for working on the Pharrell Beck album, Hyperspace, mm -hmm. for mixing that, right? And I was curious about how that came about, because, you know, they're both really legend and... Um, maybe some of your approaches to that and if there's any sort of backstory yeah i mean to be honest i never had any communication with either of them throughout the entire, the entire time i was working um huh. uh i was contacted um i don't know who contacted me to be honest someone contacted me to work on it um and um uh yeah uh yeah i his I think he would write notes and then it would, I would kind of communicate with his engineer um, and do them, but I never talked to him throughout the mixing of, of that stuff. Um, and then it came out and, and, you know, I, I still had never talked to him and actually weird. And then weirdly that um, we were, I was at the Grammys, then I saw him and I never talked to him because I was like, I'm not going to go bother him, you know? Um, <laughs> but then, it's his Grammy winning album. I mean, come on. Yeah. like. <laughs> But then um, I went to um, uh, I went to actually a party um, like a couple months ago, and he walked in, um, and I was still was like I'm not, I'm not going to bother him. But then like he he why he came actually up to me that time, and he was like he's like thanks for working on my album. And then I was chatting with him, and so I was like back you're talking first, about yeah. And then that was the first time I actually talked to him before. <laughs> cool yeah. what's he like i've never met him yeah was super nice yeah yeah great i love his music so much i love that he keeps putting out music and keeps being creative i feel like now that i'm getting older 
whenever I see artists that don't just stop making music, you know, certain artists yeah. that I love, like they just, it's in their forties and fifties, like I, you know, really back off a lot and, and he never has, I've, I've always admired him for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. But that album sounds really cool. Very synth heavy, but in like a really cool way, you know, it's like yeah. a cool vibe. And yeah, they were, I, they, I think they were trying to do a, yeah, to have a, get a, get a certain kind of vibe out of using those kind of instruments and tones. What was kind of your artistic vision for it, if you would, if you had one or something at the time? Um, I my it wasn't much of a vision. I mean, my my thought process was like, I was kind of listening to kind of the Kendrick stuff, and I thought like this has tones that are rooted in that kind of world. That I felt like if I made the rhythm section as competitive as like a Kendrick record. Um, the Pimp a Butterfly, Kend Kendrick Lamar, like that kind no, of No, actually, the Damn album. Oh, yeah, went after that. Yeah. Um, and then if I kind of, if there was a layer of kind of like an ethereal layer over top of that, like a kind of smoky vibe that just kind of existed on top of that. Because um, that was what was kind of in there, but those were kind of like, as I was doing it, I thought like if I can get the mix to that level of like the rhythm section is as banging like that, and then I can get the other stuff to kind of filter in over top of it that I felt like I would be in a pretty good situation. Yeah, that song like um, Get Lightning or Make Lightning or what was it called again? Um, it was, uh, no, hmm? No, you muted yourself. Sorry, Sean. Sorry, I guess there's a, there's a very, there's a button that's very easy to press. Um, um, oh, sorry, one second. Uh, there's a You're button back. that's to press <laughs> okay. um um uh um oh sorry what was the question i would just comment i was just uh complimenting that song like the baseline in particular on that like get lightning or make lightning or whatever that song was called something with lightning but like oh. it's so fat and big it like really rocks like, like really oh rocks. i can't totally remember i mean i didn't mix everything on that album it was kind of divided amongst of like different people for different mm -hmm. songs um but I might I can't remember if I mixed that one or not. Uh, to be honest, I kind of forget what I worked on. on, on. <laughs> it was a bit of a blur. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, yeah. I'm taking up too much time, but does anybody else have questions or anything? Dan, has there been any in the chat that you want to share? No, no. If anyone, this is a great time, you guys, if you have any questions that you would love to ask, that this would be a good time to do that. Our question. Have you had any like aha moments in your career? You were talking a little bit earlier about like um, maybe things not to do. Was that was that something you you mentioned? Like, do you have any and, and like what to avoid? And and when were the aha moments? When did those come? I think um, I think the I think the what to avoid for me in like my life has been like to play it safe. Um, I've never gotten anywhere by playing it safe. So like every time I've tuck, like taken a bigger swing or, or just done something that was kind of like unexpected, um, that seemed to um, do a lot for me. Um, and um, I guess just like, I guess I just like kept, like um i you know to to not be like to just be inspired by everything and like like listening to lots of different types of music that aren't necessarily i think that as you get older you naturally tend to like kind of fall into certain things where you know you like what you liked at a certain age um and for me i just try to keep it um i try to keep myself entertained by what is still happening um so that like i can kind of feel fresh as much as i can you know um and just to always kind of be pushing um and even when that the, the pushing fails um it always comes but i feel like it always comes back around that like my batting average is higher when i'm kind of going for it than when i'm kind of being average you know or safe or something like just like the the art of it seems to be the thing that like i think musicians are naturally artists and um they gravitate towards um 
things and situations and people that they feel like they can relate to that um, feel artistic and new and different and fresh. And so if you can entertain those people with those kind of ideas, then um, then uh, hopefully, you know, you can get more work based on that. And, and also just being, knowing your stuff enough and, and being relaxed enough with your um, equipment and your situations to be like, what do you want to do? And like, if you have all these, you know, if you develop a lot of tools um, to be able to deal with any situation that comes at you, then like you're flying because like if someone presents you with like, you know, make it sound like this, make it sound like this, make it sound like that. It's just like, if you have, you know, things in your toolbox that, that, that will allow you to get there, um, that, becomes very helpful because um yeah people will respond to that cool mm -hmm. question in the chat who's been your favorite artist you've worked with um um well it's hard to say favorite because like there are elements literally to everybody that um i like I, that i i love i mean it's it's it's, you know, it's very rare that I work with someone that I was like, that was a bad experience. Um, almost never. I mean, maybe once or twice. Um, but um, for me, um, maybe uh, I really loved working with Brittany Howard um, from the Alabama Shakes. Um, she's just a very naturally, like, kind of relaxed person. Um, and she creates an environment that allows people to create um, and she's very um, enthusiastic and excited about new ideas and, and going for them and making the time and space to explore those things. And to me, that's really important. And I feel like it helps her, it helps me, it helps everybody involved. And it just is like a, a really great kind of person to be creating around because um, it's just, yeah, it's like a nice situation to be around. So, but so then, what would be the follow-up? Would be like uh, not maybe not your favorite artist, but what's the favorite when you look back? Like, what what's the maybe the record you're most proud of? Do you have one that you think of? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I there's there are definitely things I'm proud of on a lot of things. Definitely things I'm not proud of on a lot of things. Um, that I mean, that Alabama Shakes record I am proud of because it feels like. It, it changed, I mean, I was already working pretty a lot, but like that definitely like changed the arc of my career a little bit um, where it just was like kind of right place, right time. And people were interested in her, in her and her music. And it was just like a kind of a bit of like a unique situation. And like we, happened to i mean i think that in some ways like it came out in kind of a, there was a lot of kind of weird sounding recordings on that a little bit like things that i thought were maybe sounding weird that maybe to other people sounded unique and different and it it you know some of it was by design and some of it was by you know mistake <laughs> um and um that definitely like um whatever it was that was on there like start I started getting calls in a different way you know and that led to different calls and that led to different calls but it was like that was definitely like a a a, a, a pulse that changed things I mean I was already doing fine but like and I was working on things that I was already proud of and stuff like that but it was definitely like a, a game changer in a way that I didn't expect anything to be a game changer I never I never saw that coming and I never saw I never knew what that meant like something like that happening um, until it actually did happen. And I was like, oh, that that's like significant to me in a way that was like, I didn't realize how significant it would be. Like it really just, the, it changed like almost overnight what was happening, you know? Like everything that was happening was different. You know, it was just like, I was working more on things. I was like, oh, I was excited in a different way, you know? And you got to do it in, in a way that was like yours, right? So you got to like, because on that record, you were able to like be really creative, you know, with your mixes and do a lot of the yeah, stuff probably. Luckily, that... luckily, like it happened on an album 
that I was excited about, you know, like I, I was like, Oh, we did this different, you know, yeah. I was lucky that I even got to mix it. I was an established mixer. I mean, I, I had mixed stuff, but I wasn't like a mixer that people were like, this guy should be mixing albums. It was like, I was doing, I was pretty obsessed with the rough mixes and making sure what they were leaving the studio with was something that I thought was cool. Yeah. Um, and so, and I'd been doing that my whole life where it was like, I was very, in my own mind competitive with the idea that like, if I'm going to record this, I don't want this leaving the room to go to a different mixer. Like I want to make sure that I do this to a point that like, if another mixer tries to mix this, he's going to have to like compete with my rough mix. Like I want it to be to that level. Like, I don't want to be like, I don't want to just like record something and hand it off. Like I do want to be mixing this, you know? Yeah. And so it was mostly because I just, I wanted to be doing it. So I just didn't want it to, to go to someone else. Um, so I was just wanting to make sure that like what I was giving them without saying it was like, I, I want to do this, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like I was like presenting myself as like, I could mix this, you know, like I'm showing you every day that I'm working really hard to make sure that this sounds a certain way. And by the point, by the time that we'd finished recording and everyone would be living with these rough mixes, I got a call and they were like, oh, they, the band thinks you should mix it. And I was like, hell yeah. Because <laughs> you recorded it and mixed it, right? Which yeah. Is like, do you enjoy yeah. that a lot more when you're able to do that? Yeah, because I can definitely design it. And there are things that I like to do that maybe are drastic that when you present them to people in a mix, frighten people because they're not used to hearing them. Mm. But when you are tracking it like that, people get used to it in immediately because they're it's that's all the only option they have you know they're just faced with that as the as their option so um there's no um they don't have a choice um it, yeah leaving people with no choice and, and then and then by doing that they get used to it you know and i never when i was tracking stuff i never apologized for it i never said like is this okay i would just i would confidently be recording something in a way that I thought was like, this to me is cool. And if I don't present that I'm nervous about it and I'm showing a level of confidence as I'm doing it, that people will probably jump on board and they'll get used to it just, you know, you know, just fast because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're in the room with me. What do you usually another do in rough mix? Another one. Of... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. There's Thanks. another one from the chat. Can you talk about working with Casey Musgrave, specifically the vocal tone on Starcrossed? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, another album that I was kind of surprised to get a call about, because um, I mean, I'm not known for country music at all. Um, but I guess what happened was on her previous album, uh, Golden Hour, um, they had tried to get um, this the singer of Tame Impala to mix it, because um, he's a really incredible mixer. I mean, he mixed the last two Tame Impala records and they sound amazing. Um, but I, I don't know if he was busy or, I mean, I don't, maybe he doesn't want to be like a professional mixer because he's got a huge band. Um, so they, they couldn't get him to do it. And then um, maybe something in my work to them reminded them, I mean, I definitely used his recordings as reference points. So maybe they heard that um, and then they asked me to do it. Um, and um, so to be honest, when I was working on that music, uh, I was like, instead of thinking of it as like country music, I was, because they had told me that they were looking for like almost a Tame Impala vibe. I, even though it doesn't sound like that, even to me, somehow in my mind at that, in that time, as I was doing it, I was trying to get it into like a Tame Impala kind of vibe. Um, and so much so that like when I was a being it with the rough mixes, I was kind of terrified that they were going to be horrified by my mixes because I thought like I'm really I'm really pushing this to like kind of in a crazy way. Um, but yeah, they ended up being like down and and uh, yeah, it was like a, it was really it worked out. Um, specifically, Starcrossed, I can't remember um, what I did on that vocal tone exactly. Um, probably the Fairchild and um, yeah, I can't exactly remember. Um, 
I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, I might have to go in a second here because um, my, my next session is about to start up. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. We appreciate you staying so long. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, sorry to that I'm, I might have to go here. Really appreciate it. Go, go ahead and go. Go get that work done. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate Wonderful. It. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no problem at all. I hope it was uh, helpful to anyone. <laughs> Very helpful. And then Dan, do, do we usually get these up like on YouTube or something at some point? Yeah. Is it okay, Sean, if we post this on, on our YouTube site? Yeah, that's no problem. Okay, great. It, it'll take a few days for us to do what we need to, but uh, we'll put it up and Michael will send you the link if you want to share it with anybody. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, thank Sean. Thanks nice so much. All right. Well, nice, inter nice interview, Micah. Thank hey, you. Hey, Micah. Great to see you. Great to see you too. I'll, I'll yeah. hit you up that, the next summer. I'm going to be back down there Perfect. in yeah. LA area. So I'll, I'll be sure to, we'll get lunch or something. Amazing. Come on down. Awesome. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye. See ya. All right. Nice job, Micah. Oh, thanks. How'd it go? Wonderful. Good. Wonderful. Good questions. Everyone had you. some really interesting questions too. Yeah. So everybody, you can un, un, turn on your camera and so forth. And uh, do you want to wrap it up or sum up anything, Micah? That was oh, fascinating I, hearing about your time with Sean up there. And yeah. Uh, you know, I will say uh, another little advertisement for the Banff Center, because a lot of people don't know about it in the U.S. It's a, In Canada, it's a little bit bigger, more known, but um, it's not far up kind of by Calgary from here. But they have, you know, eight or nine audio associates, they call them, where you get like a four month uh, fellowship, I think is what they call it. Um, and you can stay longer too. like he stayed for up to four years sometimes even, but it's kind of up to the person, but you have really cool sessions. And there's a lot of classical, like there's a really famous string quartet competition that they record up there. Um, there's a jazz festival up there and there's a number of things. And so, and there's really cool studios and it's a really wonderful place to learn. And so if you are in the place in your life where you like, and I'm maybe talking to my students a little more, if you are in the place in your life where you can ap apply for some of this stuff, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a good spot. Yeah. I was actually one of those 40 year olds at the Banff Center. Uh, actually, back in 2005, probably a little uh, after you guys left or something, but it was definitely life changing for me uh, doing like experimental music and they were so open to everything. It's a really great place. It is a cool place. They have a really big art program. They're also really famous for the, you know, their Banff Center for Mountain Culture, which is like that film festival that goes on tour. I just saw it at the Benaroya Hall a few months ago. But um, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff up in the BAMP Center. But yeah, they have a big art program too. So they're kind of open to like more artistic and types of things. And it's funded again by the government, which is great because then you can like, it, it's a little more solid in that way. So so Robert, you were there, which state year? 2005, you said? 2005, yeah. Yeah, it was a little after. I was 01 and 02, I think. So a little before you. <laughs> were you, uh, was Teresa there when you were there? Yeah, she was. I had taken a class there in... Um uh human interface design for music new interfaces for musical expression there's a conference that goes on every year and um i had taken a class from bill verplank at stanford in uh, this is 2001 or so um and it was in using arduinos and microcontroller arduino was relatively new at that time microcontrollers to build sort of uh input devices for yourself with whatever things you can come up with switches or i was using conductive bits of rubber and um they hosted the class at the Banff center so i met Teresa, and i said this place is really something different and i'd love to come back here she said well why don't you let's let's book you a like a work study and you can work on your next project and it was it was great that's cool. Yeah. That's Is that cool. a year round thing or just summers? Year round. Year round. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I went up there for a, in the winter for like a week long producing uh, uh, session uh, class. What, what are they called? Uh, educational class or something. That was a week long. That was taught by that guy, John. We mentioned him briefly, John Sorensen. Yeah. But yeah, he, he worked a lot. Um, and now I think he's a lawyer. He went to law school and was in Toronto, but yep. he did a lot of cool records. Um, was he there when you were there too? 
Uh, I, I seem to remember that, but I don't remember all the people I kind of hit out in my lab, but there was, uh, uh, you know, just so much going on. They would always do things like they set up a surround recording microphone array, and then you could walk down the hall. This was in a different location, but it was hosted by the band center. Um, and you go down the hall and listen to what it sounded like on a set of speakers while the quartet is still playing. So you could sort of take in what that mic array sounded like live. It was pretty interesting. And, you know, little things like that. People would come into a master class and, you know, um, talk to everybody in very casual environments. I'm sure you remember. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Very cool. Anyway, that's it, Dan. That's all I wanted to say. Great, thank you. Well, let's yeah. go into the uh, here and what every who everybody is and where you are and what your audio story is. Um, I'll call on people, and if you would unmute your mic and turn your camera on if you can, so to, to say hello, that would be great. Uh, so, Steve Savanyu. I'm going to use a rest real quick. Okay, go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Savanyu. I'm uh, in Ohio, where it's 73 degrees today. Mm -hmm. I am uh, in the audio industry for about 50 years. Uh, currently, I semi-retired from the corporate world, running my own production company, uh, do a lot of classical stuff and jazz things. I'm set up for a jazz session today, which I'm doing tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm heading over to the Symphony Hall to hang mics tomorrow morning. I'm doing Mahler's Third this week with a mass of musicians. So looking forward to that. It's always fun to come to Pacific Northwest AES things. And thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Good to hear from you. Rod Evenson, where are you? What are you up to? Um, um, uh, the Portland, Oregon area, uh, Milwaukee, Oregon, uh, to be specific. And uh, I'm uh, getting ready this evening to go to uh, Arlene Snitzer Concert Hall tomorrow morning to uh, do a recording for the Portland Youth Philharmonic um, and their annual children's uh, concert where they bus in loads of school children to hear the Portland Youth Philharmonic. So that's what's on my agenda at the moment. And, uh, um, and I've been listening to this in the background while <laughs> doing other things. <laughs> in the process uh so just getting ready to load up and go out the door at 5 a.m tomorrow morning <laughs> okay all right well good luck with that thank you thanks thank you all right paul lee where are you what's your audio deal well hi um can you hear hi. me okay yep okay great I, i'm really sorry i'm not an uh, audio engineer i'm um uh, a staff person here at Seattle Pacific University, All right. and uh, and and I just got the uh, invitation here. And I've always been kind of um, <clears throat> interested in sound engineering. Um, maybe a, a, a pseudo audio file myself. Um, <laughs> so I thought I would I would just pop in and and see what you all are talking about. So thanks for having me around. Cool. Thanks for joining us. What do you do at SPU? I work in the machine shop in the engineering department. Awesome. Are you and a machinist? Um, yeah. So my my background is as a machinist um, uh, by trade, um, but I've always been uh, I'm I'm a musician myself. Um, you know, a little picking and a little digging that sort of thing, and um, um, I've always been fascinated by by the you know how different sound engineers could really produce a massive difference in the quality of my sound. So. Um, ever since then, I, I've always I've always enjoyed, or I, I've always uh, wanted to learn more about what it means uh, uh, to become a sound engineer. So, and often thought maybe we could have a crossover degree in the uh, engineering department slash uh, sound engineering department. You know, yeah, uh, maybe 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 creating some different um, effects or something like that. So, I I should point out that. <laughs> A recording lathe is a machinist's job, basically. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you're if you're cutting for vinyl. Oh yeah, that's that's true. And being a machinist is an artistic profession. It's very precise, and finished work can be beautiful. Well, I certainly feel that way. So thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks for joining us. Feel free to 
come with us. We've got a website that announces our upcoming meetings. Uh, okay. And it, it, it's not really a school to how to become a sound engineer, but it uh, we illuminate different parts of what it means to be a sound engineer or what mm. aspects of audio we happen to look at. So feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Janie Wallach, where are you? What are you up to? I'm in Seattle, Washington, and uh, tomorrow night I am recording Via Farker Ture at Jazz Alley. Really? Cool. Mm -hmm. I've recorded him a few times when he's been in Seattle, and uh, yeah. He's I'm the sorry. son of Ollie? Yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, he's very good. <laughs> I bet. Say hi to him for us. Oh, will do. Where's he from? Molly? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Fabrizio De Melio. Yeah. Hi. Can you see hi. me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. How you doing? Pretty good. Fabrizio from Sacramento here. And I work for, I'm an acoustics engineer. I work for Keith Yates Design. And I actually moved here a year ago now. Um, so we we design spaces, um, mostly private theaters, but also recording studios and listening rooms. So it was interesting to um, to connect for the, for, for this um, meeting here, and it was actually very interesting to see the room that uh, Sean uh, is working his live room. I was really interested in that. And also when he talked about uh, the mansion, when he recorded uh, that song with Adele in the, in the mansion, I wanted to ask a question about that, to be honest, but I didn't make it on time. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. That's cool. How did you find out about this? Uh, through a yes. Awesome. Yeah, a yes. A yes. I was actually also I actually worked for um, for Banff um, Theater uh, before before moving here. I was working in London at um, for Sound Space Vision, and we were doing the, the we we're working on the refurbishment of, of Banff Center uh, with uh, KPMB, the architects. I'm not sure uh, what happened there. We were working on the. We, design of the theater and then there was also the project was um there was an expansion of the of the center itself um i actually should look it up and see and see what happened it was a kind of a long-term uh, project and the first phase was to um refurbish the the theater and the film festival was a, a big big part of um of the the brief and the, the for the design do you have any any news of what happened with that um, the project? Did they start uh, did they start building or something like that? When when were you there, or when were you doing that? Um, working on bound uh, refurbishment or revitalization, um, two thousand and nineteen, hmm. twenty. Um, I know they've done a lot of work there. I, I was there in maybe 2015. I went back, actually, Teresa brought me back as a faculty. So I went for a week in 2015, I think, in Tots uh, uh, there for a week. And I know even from when I had been there, you know, 15 years earlier to then, it was like drastically different. They'd built a lot of buildings and new spaces and theaters. <laughs> so from 2019, I'm not sure, but like it uh, sounds pretty cool. It was for the uh, Banff uh, Film Festival. Is that what you said? Yeah, I mean the 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 project was for the the whole center to add spaces and renovate the the, the theater. Uh, there was also going to be, I think, a multi-purpose space with a I think a movable wall. I mean, probably probably things have changed now, or um, because you know when you, you design a space, there's also always things change and being remodeled and redesigned. But uh, yeah, the the main idea was to. Uh, add uh, uh, another building um, next to it that would be connected to the main one, if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah, with new spaces, multi-purpose for also for performing arts in general. Um, 
yeah um yeah i should i should see what happened with that project to be honest so okay. then I, I i moved i moved here and started working for for this other company so um i lost contact with that uh, with that project but it was it was nice i mean to 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 hear bump center again i didn't i didn't know that uh, you were connected with that so yeah. yeah i missed the beginning of what you said what is it exactly so what do you do are you, do you work in acoustics or what is it that you yeah do? i'm an acoustics engineer so we basically uh, design we work with architects and uh, the design team to to um design uh performing art spaces mm-hmm. i mean this is basically my back, background so uh building building design on everything that concerns acoustics uh noise and vibration control and here in the US, um, Sacramento area, I'm working with uh, Keith Yates Design, and we do um, we sp- we're known for uh, private theaters uh, mostly. So all the AV design for that spaces, acoustics, and the architecture as well. Do you so live in Sacramento, or where do you live now? Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm talking. Uh, I'm right right here in Sacramento at the moment. Yeah, yeah I moved. I moved here. Nice. Is a private theater in some rich person's house the four seat or something? Or it's usually it's usually yeah uh, residential. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, I could get could get even to fourteen seats or uh, even more. Uh, it, it depends, but usually yeah, I, I think it goes from yeah four to on average four to ten eight. Cool. Uh, it's usually yeah high end um, specifications and good budgets, which is a good thing because it lets you <laughs> experiment and uh, and go all the way sometimes with um, all the craziest ideas and equipment that you can think of. Um, hmm. Do you ever give presentations about that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah, it depends. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it, it could be. Um, I was trying to uh, get in contact with um, AIA, um, uh, which is the associate association, American Association for Architects. Yeah, and they have a, a branch here in, in Sacramento, um, Central Valley, I think it's called. Um, hmm. But also, it could be interesting for maybe for AES. Um, um, I've never done one myself, but I was thinking about mm, presenting a paper on, for um, for a conference next year. I think it's in France. It's about electroacoustics. Um, I don't remember exactly the, the the name of the of the conference, but yeah, it was. Um, it, it's it's about acoustics and electroacoustics. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm. I'd be really interested in um, talking about these things. Great. Can you send me your email address in the chat? Just pr- private message me in yeah. the chat here. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about the, doing something for us in the future. Yeah, that's great. There, there was a comment. Uh, bet you work with lots of airports. Was that for Paul? Or, or sorry, was that for Fabrizio? Paul? Have you worked in lots yeah. of airports? Okay. Yeah, that was a <laughs> kind of a, a joking comment, I, I, you know, for Fabrizio. <laughs> yeah. Fabrizio, have you worked in airports? <laughs> like you mean you mean designing airports? Well, well yeah, I know uh, airports often get a lot of complaints about noise abatement. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In that sense, mm-hmm. I was thinking more about like uh PABA systems like uh there's a, a whole like uh study on on these things um public address systems and um speech intelligibility and for, for in these spaces like train stations and airports and things but yeah another huge problem it was at the time when I was in London it was like it was a hot topic about Heathrow uh, I think they wanted to expand and I think it was Heathrow, maybe another airport. They wanted to expand and build another uh, runaway, and um, uh, and there was a whole discussion about uh, noise levels and monitoring these noise levels and making sure that uh, 
uh, neighbors to, uh, will not complain about it, you know, and planning and all these these issues. It's uh, it's a huge thing. I'm, I mean, I never really worked myself firsthand on this on these uh, problems, but it's 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 a thing. And then with the world of acoustics is it's a huge thing. Well, you mentioned working in small theater settings of sorts. Uh, I know that Portland International Airport has a little uh, theater, if you will, for travelers who are waiting to make connections on their stop <laughs> and have to sit around a lot. And uh, oh, I, no, I was I was in Portland last Thanksgiving. I have two friends that live there. Uh, next time, I'll uh, make sure I'll, <laughs> I'll look for this theater there. Is it in the airport? Is it? Um, yes, Portland International Airport on the uh, in the South Wing, um, and uh, it's just running movies continuously. You can walk in, and they're they're usually kind of short. But uh, um, you know, if you if you've got to wait for a connecting flight to somewhere, there there it is. And so, huh, what a cool idea! Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Fabrizio. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Barry, yeah. Barry, where are you and what are you up to? I'm guessing you're Barry McCord. Maybe not. Okay, Robert, uh, what? Hewitt, Hewitt. Hewitt, okay, great, where are you? Uh, I'm in uh, Nova Scotia, I'm in Cape Breton. In All right. Cape, where it's 1230. Um, but uh, I wanted to tune in because it looked like it would be great, and it was. Um, I uh, went to one of the early schools for sound recording in Fredonia in the New York State College System back, I graduated in 1987. And since that, have done a pretty wide ranging career, you know, you name it. Um, and uh, the 10 years prior to COVID, I was working at the Metropolitan Opera. So that was pretty great. And then uh, COVID. Hey got us to move to Canada. And now I'm back as a freelancer uh, mixing. Mostly these days, I mean, I'll do anything that comes along, but uh, I've been mixing short classical music films for the San Francisco Opera and for the Cleveland Orchestra. So they'll profile an artist and do some music. Uh, San Francisco is really cool. They take artists from uh, with an unusual story or from an unusual place and then go to their hometown and uh, do a profile and maybe do some uh traditional music or something like that so those have been fun to mix wow must have been intense being in the metropolitan opera were you mixing mixing sound there uh, it was pretty cool i was a, a broadcast engineer uh wow. mostly my biggest responsibility was getting the opera on the radio to the world on hmm. saturdays and on sirius a few nights a week which is a pretty big deal um, yeah but uh, we also produced any pre-recorded material that went on the radio or uh, the videos to a mix the stuff that went on the HDs. Um, you know, we recorded everything and we were responsible for the setup of the of the the studio where they recorded multi-track and did the big productions. And they have real heavy hitter, you know, David Frost is the producer, um, you know kind of milk in that place for Grammys, you know, it's a really great <laughs> studio they have and, uh, you know, a microphone cabinet that's as worth a house, you know, it's really <laughs> fun that way. A great thing about the Met is that everybody there is, uh, you know, always, always giving it 110%. They're just like really proud of their work and things really happen when a thousand people come together like that. So it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. And the musicians are, are just ridiculous like like going to the olympics every day yeah awesome well, what years were you there me. i was curious what years you were there at the met 2011 until uh 2021 covid uh, and then i kept working there for a year from here we put the opera on the radio using the archives go back forever and they have everybody um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So we produced out of the archives for the year. And then when it was time to go back, um, my wife is from Canada to, we have two young children. It's like, there was no going back once you're, once you got set up in Canada, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's good. I, um, I lived in New York from 05 to 07, but my friend, uh, Billy Hunter is the principal trumpet there at the Mets. 
And so I remember him taking me down there and showing me like a lot of the, like, it's insane, the sets. Like, I don't know if you guys can, like, the biggest, like, opera, obviously the biggest and well-funded opera company, probably in the world, at least in the country. And they have like four sets, right? I think this is right. Yeah. That they taking every time they're gigantic sets. So they're just the tallest sets that you can. And there's one on the left, one on the right. And then the normal, and then there's one like underground as well. And they can rotate them. It's pretty insane. Right. They have a gigantic stage. Like there's a joke that goes, uh, you know, the, they're masters of illusion. If they want it to look like a six story staircase, well, they build a six story staircase on the stage. (laughs) Uh, And there's an entire stage to the left on a on a cart and there's an entire stage to the right on a cart and then there's a a turntable stage that goes to the back of the stage and that comes out and then all of those are equipped with uh numerous traps and uh it was it's unbelievable there and uh Mm -hmm. i miss it terribly but it it wasn't fitting as a career move for me it's kind of like uh my job was like a chip window, just keep doing what you do. And there probably won't progress too much depending on, you know, you know, how staff come and go. So uh, once we got set up in Canada, and I went back to being in my own studio, it's so quiet, it's, it's, you know, I'm enjoying it. And I'm, and I'm making use of the experience, the producer who hires me for that other stuff, also is a, is a, uh, you know, an alumni of the Met. So I uh, made some good contacts there. Awesome. I had a guy who worked for me for a while who got a job as a, as a stagehand at the Met, and he took me through the building, all these amazing, huge storage spaces and gigantic elevators. and It's the dustiest, mustiest amazing. tower you'll ever see. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. If you do, you have pictures from your time there, of the oh, things yeah. that you did. Yeah, yeah, you we used to, we had this uh, distribution room that was in the third basement, and um, uh, you, that's where they stored the set pieces before they went out to storage and warehouses. So there was by the freight elevator. So you'd go down there and be like, you know, Roman statues sticking out of a hamper. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I probably uh, I would be remiss to try to share it here. They're really. Uh, um, touchy about uh, representation, especially if I'm not working. There. Right, right. Understood. Well, that's cool. That what an awesome experience to yeah, well, it's, have it's great. had. It's great for my ears too. Good. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Gary, where are you? What are you up to, Gary Louis? I'm in uh, Seattle, Washington. I'm not too far from. Dan, and uh, I uh, am the uh, Secretary of the Pacific Northwest Section and uh, I'm Chair of the Tellers Committee for the entire AES, which uh, runs the uh, annual elections worldwide. And I'm a life AES member. My, uh, my day job, uh, which actually seems to run all day and all night and all weekends sometimes, <laughs> is as the uh, recording person for the University of Washington School of Music. I still, Gary, at some point, I still want you to, like, I want you to give me a, a tour. I would love to come see what, like, what you have out there, and, you know, and I could show you actually what we have at SPU and stuff too, maybe. Sure. It's, yeah. it's a dump, really, actually, in our end, because it's, we don't run a recording program as such. So I'm uh, at the beck and call of the performing groups, basically. Do you know Tekla? Do you work with her, the violinist there? Yeah. yeah. Tekla She's a friend of mine. Yeah, I've oh. recorded, uh, I recorded her string quartet. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like an early music string quartet. This is like 10 years ago in the Bay Area. It was a long time ago. But when yeah. I came up here, I knew she was up here. So I, I yeah. hit her up and then she she hired me last summer to record a few concerts. She does this Whidbey Island Music Festival now. So she runs like this classical music festival, a lot of early music, but a lot of other stuff too. Um, Cause she, this Tecla runs the early music program at UW. Yeah. And, and so, um, but this Whidbey Island music festival is very cool too. They do a lot of cool stuff out there. Look cool venues out, out there. Any, any chance I get to like go out there and do any work is, you know, yeah, especially in the summer. On, the, on the islands in the summer is the, good for the soul. It's a good gig. 
Mm -hmm. we, had it, Mac, we had Mac, Mac Perkins uh, attending this a while ago. He dropped out, but he's a Whid, Whidbey Island uh, resident, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It, it may be just me as a non-musician, but that, that early music stuff, it, it always sounds out of tune to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is a little bit. That's the point, right? It's yeah, not I equal guess. temperament. Well, also the the students we have playing it are are rookies, pretty much, because most of them have, have never seen the you know the gamba or something like that. So <laughs> they're scratching away at their, their best. That's about it for me. All right, thanks, and Micah. Do you have anything else you want to add to? No. What you said earlier. Nice job again. Oh, thanks. Yeah, did, did it go well? I thought so. Good. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. He's a real interesting and engaging guy and really uh, engagingly enthusiastic. And I, uh, that has to be attractive to his clients because he's, it seems like he's always trying new stuff. He is. And he's very like musical in that way, you know, as an engineer. Yeah. It's interesting. Like he's very creative and artistic, yeah. which, you know, is pretty cool. I thought his big Samples. studio room was fascinating. Totally. Yeah, really yeah. cool space. Yeah. I, I was a little confused by the hard concrete floor and the that, like domed ceiling and, and brick walls, but what he, he said, he puts rugs down there when he tracks and stuff, I guess, but. Yeah, yeah. and the ceiling looked to be exposed wood, so it's not gonna be super reflective. Yeah, I was confused by that. Confuse a little bit too. Hmm? Yeah. Fabrizio, Fabrizio was, saying was trying to say something there. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we overlap. No. Yeah. When uh, the comment about the uh, the concrete floor and um, the bowed wood ceiling, I was uh, for for a second, I was like, there must be some interesting acoustics in that space. So I was really interested in like listening. What was the how it was make it could make it work and um but yeah rags were probably one part of the solution i think he also records i think in the, there's another room that's closer to that control room which is like mm. more of a, a a smaller space that he also uses i think so it's not always in the big room i think it's yeah, yeah. that big room had a pretty high ceiling um, yeah probably 20 foot high which is going to help just give it a nice big open space. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of too bad we couldn't hear anything. I I, I was not going to let him play anything because we get copyright problems uh, with this YouTube thing. So uh -huh. if he had pl been able to play samples rather than songs, that would have been cool. But I forgot to mention, but if you go into, I actually just found this this week, actually. But if you go into Spotify, a couple of people have made playlists of like his stuff he worked on like oh wow so if you just kind of search his name in spotify it'll pull up all, all of those records he was talking about mm, cool if you want yeah I, I wanted to know what that picture of the tape recorder behind micah is it, it looks like it's kind of a artistic representation rather than a real <laughs> it is not a real one <laughs> It's on the wall. It's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's that, that. It's just a drawing. It's a painting that I thought looked cool. right. But uh, kind of a '70s vibe. It goes with the wood doors, you know. It does. Yeah. All right. Anybody else want to talk about anything? You know, there's a lot of classical recordists in the group tonight. It'd be interesting to see what your techniques are, and you know what what you do. And I have kind of a unique situation in my um ej thomas hall it's a 75 foot drop to the hang point for all the flying mics and there's nowhere to get above the ceiling because it's a floating ceiling uh and my assistant used to scale the beams and drop the lines down and then they got a new uh um operations manager for the facility and he saw him doing that and he says, no more. So during the COVID shutdown, he, my assistant's kind of a MacGyver guy. He developed this mic cable winding system that'll do 100 feet of mic cable and drop it without slippering. So it drops it down 
and then it pays it back up and pays it into like a capture basket. And so now I've got a motor controller and I just walk out with this little box and flip these switches and the lines come down, put the mics mm -hmm. on, put the fish line on, put the switches up, raising back up i can nudge them and all that it's really they, cool i just wonder what other people do and they, they do sell those uh, reelers commercially yeah they're called servo reelers and the oh. problem with the servo reelers is they're limited to 25 feet of hang hmm. and I've, we, I've used two of those servo reelers they actually speak it up they use them at bath so teresa yeah. set them up at bath and that's where i first got them but then when i got a job teaching at ut arlington in texas um we were setting up a, a, a new uh, classical recording system in the hall. And I remembered that servo reeler stuff. I think it's in like in Long Island or something. Yep. But, um, but like they, uh, yeah, but they're limited in that way, but they're also really expensive too. Yeah. They're about, they're, I don't know. They're, they're super expensive, but because of the, uh, the limit, they can only handle about 25 feet of cable. And uh, we needed something it could do. Well, we, we, our goal is to do a hundred and we're doing 80 foot drops. So, uh, but it's, it's so much nicer. You don't have to scamper up in the rigging anymore. So. Yeah. Did you see that AES presentation from a, a week or so ago, the Williams tree? Did you go to that one? Did not go to that one. It was a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, approach to miking for surround for immersive sound. Okay. And and uh, taking all these really, really precise measurements into consideration, the mics end up mounted on the spines of like an umbrella shaped stand. Mm -hmm. So you get their precise distance from each other distributed in a circle accounting for their patterns. It was, it was super deep. This guy I'm looking at mm -hmm. right now. Uh, Williams, what is his first name? Um, oh, there's Michael Williams. That's it. Yeah. Uh, out of uh, uh, somewhere in near Paris. Is, yeah. is as close as I can get to the name. Bryce or Marne, something like that. On the River Marne. How many microphones in this array? Well, it could be different numbers. And that was the idea. It'd be hard for me to summarize the whole thing. But one right. of the things he did was to come up with patterns. Uh, with different numbers of microphones uh, and in such a way that when you wanted a mix for different immersive formats, be it Aero 3D or Atmos, uh, you could just kind of remove mics instead of mixing them differently and arraying them differently. It was, it was fascinating and um, hmm. heavy on the math and hmm. he must have an amazing listening environment. And, you know, I found it, it all works great until I need the harp up for a couple bars. You know, you get this perfect recording of the room and what it sounds like in there, but maybe that's not what the producer's asking for. Okay. Yeah, in the end, the producer has the final word. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I do want to hear more of these kind of recordings because it sounded like a great way to get a uh, just a clean starting point, you know. Well, with me and going to our into Arlene Schnitzer concert hall, uh, there are cables hanging from above the stage, and then they the microphones are attached to those and pulled back uh, from the uh, the dress circle in the balcony with fish line. I was I was just trying to see if I could find a link to something that I've done in there, um, and um, let me see. I'll, so, I'll be back with you in a moment here, but uh, what kind of mics and what kind of array are you hanging? Oh, well, I, I'm I'm using uh, Neumann Solution D almost exclusively in that space, and it sets up quickly uh, uh, for me. And uh, and we take it the 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 setup is largely based on John Ergel, and I think a few weeks ago I showed that diagram in. Uh, uh to uh one of our tea time topics meetings uh but uh I those mean, are your digital mics uh, digital oh. mics yes yeah uh now they are vintage microphones right <laughs> but uh, <laughs> as, as of about a year ago because they're discontinued yeah um incredible uh 
it, it's too bad. Uh, I and I have um, three DM, Neumann DMI eight control boxes, two of which are Ravenna protocol, and they're hooked into Pyramix. Wow, uh, nice. Course, um, so, uh, but it's um, a nice setup. He's shown us pictures of it. It's really cool. I I've, I think some of the pictures I showed were in. Uh, let me see if I can find that what I pulled out the other week. Um, okay. We need to open screen share. Um, oh, yeah, maybe. But I, I have I have to find them first. <laughs> Good. All right. Let me do that um, here. Uh, photos. Let's see. Thanks, Gary. Well. Anybody have any other questions they want to ask while we're here or you have a problem you've been working on that you could use some sage advice from somebody? And Rod, just say when you're ready there. Okay. Let's see. I've got a question here for maybe Janie. Um, so when you're, maybe this is uh, showing a little bit of my uh, uh, novishness here. Uh, but when you're when you're mixing a room or when you're do, when you're uh, doing a production in a in a room like the Jazz Alley, you mentioned mm -hmm. you were doing a show at Jazz Alley. Mm -hmm. uh, is it kind of a straightforward thing, or do you kind of bring your own kind of aesthetic to the sound, or or uh, what, what do you think made that person hire you back? Well, I um, I do my own mix. I it's not just a straight board feed for one thing. I do have that, but I also have um, a really nice uh, Shure VP88 stereo microphone. And I generally put that as in as good of a position as I possibly can, given the circumstances. At Jazz Alley, it's pretty difficult because Generally speaking, there's really no place at the back of the room to put it, and nobody wants to hang it. So I kind of have to put it on a very short stand in um, on the stage in front of uh, as as in front of the speakers as possible. With you know, and I basically basically put a short mic stand on the floor of the stage. And then with the mic pointing straight up, just so that I am getting um, audience, I'm getting some of the uh, uh, acoustic uh, instruments and vocals um, and whatever of the band, the drums, whatever. Um, but mainly I'm getting board feed and I'm mixing it all together. So I have two tracks of board feed, left and right board feed, left and right mic. Uh, so four inputs. And then I all I also have a stereo mix that the recorder make, makes automatically as well. So is there also something particular with this uh, with this uh, musical act that you that you're uh, doing that you know about them? Or well, can you describe what they are? First of all, Oh, he's African music, basically. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And yeah. is he guitar or some other instrument? Uh, yes. <laughs> His father's a guitar, I think. Yeah, and he plays guitar as well. Okay. And um, last time he just had a, a trio, I think. So it was like guitar, bass, and drums, pretty much. Um, uh, that, that type of, I don't know what he has this year. It's, so would you describe the instruments other than guitar like traditional instruments? Um, not particularly. Okay. Okay. And so not necessarily. Yeah. Although sometimes, you know, I've I have recorded all kinds and I have recorded traditional instruments before with other bands. So and, it, and to be clear, your recording is parallel to the in sound, in room sound right your only connection is the feed from whatever they're mixing to you right exactly exactly yeah. okay other than that it's my mic and i mix my mic with the board feed basically to i i i call it enhanced live mm -hmm. you know it's kind of you definitely get the cleanliness of a board feed but 
you know, if somebody pulls out a tambourine and they're playing it on their hip and it's nowhere near a mic, I can still pick it up with the mic, mm -hmm. with my room mic, you know. Paul, does that make sense? Paul, did that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. You yes, like sorry about that. I was having That's some okay. technical challenges here, but thank you. That's That was very no helpful. Problem. No problem. Okay, Rod, are you having any luck? Um, sure. Well, I've got I've got something different, but maybe it's a little more interesting uh, than Schnitzer. Uh, but um, uh, let me share screen with this here. This um, this is um, the, uh, the Skyview uh, Auditorium in uh, Vancouver, Washington. And this is a setup I did for a Vancouver Symphony, Vancouver USA Symphony, if you will. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it was, it was uh, a holiday concert uh, jazz. It was also during COVID as I recall, because there was no audience for it. So I had, I pretty much had uh, control of all of it. This is, uh, back of my console the front of it do you want to go to the first picture and show your mic technique there or your okay. mic setup oops i'm oh, going back too far different well um let's see if i can zoom in on the uh, the first one showed a uh a, a mic there you go there's a there's a deck of tree mm -hmm. up there and uh, i'm looking for my zoom controls here on this uh there you I should have. okay there we go and uh so you got how many mics up center, there le uh five microphones on that left center right and two cardioids facing rear the ones facing the front are uh neumann pm133 omnis and i'm sorry it's a bit of a blurry picture there but um that's that we're one. getting the idea yeah and uh then backing up um uh, there was a vocal soloist on this end then there was a small jazz ensemble on stage um let's see if i can zero no that's a different setup um going forward um pair of omnis over the percussion as well as uh some spot mics one one spot mic on the snare the other is to sort of uh fill out the, the bass drum you know the, the kick drum um let's see what's the I drum have... shield down center um yeah is that for covid Oh yes, I mean this was during COVID, so there's shields yeah. all over everything. <laughs> okay. Um, I I used um, a coincident pair here uh, for uh, an area around uh, the concert master and uh, and the first violins uh, because she had some solo work. And, what, is uh, the, what was the little bracket that was holding the two mics? That was kind of cool. Um, try to remember who makes that. Um, an outfit in Great Britain. Um, but it's it's part it's partly made of a of a, a Sennheiser uh, mic suspension, um, and uh, and then a couple of clips that. Uh, that hold the microphones together and it's an MS pair mm -hmm. you, you can uh, I'll zoom in on that mm -hmm. I think I can do that easy uh, this is uh, the bi-directional one is a Neumann KM120 and then the uh, uh, the uh, hypercardioid is um, Neumann KM185 mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, they come close to one another in terms of their proximity effect. So it makes a good coincident pair. Hmm. But uh, cool. 
And what else do I have hiding here? Um, what what was that miking? The cello or something? Um, uh, concert master, first violin. Uh, uh, pretty close right. to her. And I wonder if sound field makes the uh, the bracket. Um, no. Um, mm. If you'll excuse me a minute, I'll come back and tell you. And I gotta get going here at nine. But um, okay. Good I'll to see you, Micah. Thank you. Good to thank see you, Micah. Too. Yeah, um, thank you. Meeting. Great oh. meeting. It was, I hope it was helpful. Yeah, it, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. So thank you guys for it have been coming. right on the top of my head. Right coat. Oh, yeah. You've heard uh, of that. Okay. Okay. Take care, Micah. And uh, so what else have I got? I mean, there's uh, 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 the Zenheiser. That was the announced mic, and it's a wireless uh, and I, I had to take a feed from the house for that, but uh, uh, it matches the rest of the, the Neumann collection pretty well. And then this is the KM, uh, the D01 digital microphone. And uh, I tried to order another one of those more recently uh, at about the time when they were closing out. And they'd sold them all out. There were no more left. What's the... Right. Uh fiber case right below the poinsettia that's kind of a cool old school style gear case um um i will move up to that i think i've got there there it is okay um that holds a pair of dmi 8 ravenna protocol um uh, those take in all the digital microphones and you can see i use them all <laughs> in that and then, uh, so there were six, there were 16 into that. And Cat5 uh, cable. The, the case connected. itself, the case itself came from an Ampex uh, AM10 solid state mixer that is <laughs> in the boneyard, mm -hmm. so to say. So the case survives the Ampex, so-so. Uh, I have several of those. The case <laughs> survived the gear that was in it. Yeah. Um, so it's cat five cable between that box and each of the cat, digital mics. The cat six. Okay, cat, cat six, six is preferred. Cat five E minimum. Mm -hmm. So um, and that that goes to the other thing over here. And there they go into the Ethernet switch back mm -hmm. there. So uh, What else can I tell you about this? I thought I had some other pictures of Schnitzer in here, but uh, I don't see them right offhand. And, uh, but let's see if I can find something else because I do have a list of links here, stream links. What have I got? I recall it during COVID when there were no or few audiences we could be much more liberal with where we ran cables. Yeah, Once you yeah. started getting people in the room, now you got to get back to dressing things and covering with mats if people walk on them. And oh, yeah. Anybody want to share anything else before we call it a day? It's always good to see everybody on the West Coast. Thank you. It's good to see you too. Enjoy, Likewise. Okay. Enjoy the post uh, session afterglow whatever you want to call it <laughs> between between the, and when when this when this and hollywood sapphire are in the same week it is a long two nights for me i bet I it bet. is I bet. because hollywood sapphire we do an afterglow as well and we've afterglowed till three in the morning oh my, oh my god gosh. yeah <laughs> on on the zoom and of course being on the on the west Co or on the east coast yeah they're they're you know they're like, oh, yeah, it's only midnight here. I'm going, it's like three o'clock in the morning for me. So, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. Eesh. it's always mm. a pleasure to you know, catch up with everybody. So, same. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, okay. everybody. Okay. Yep. All right. Good night. Good, good night. Everybody. See ya. Take care. Bye. See you Take Saturday. Care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.